right, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. The first thing is to review and approve the agenda. I do not have any changes to make. Do you? Yes. Yeah, I forgot. I should have mentioned this uh, earlier. We need to add payroll and bills approval to the consent agenda. It's just got knocked off. Payroll and bills. Okay. Um, we can talk about that when we okay. get to uh, the consent agenda. Any other changes? Okay. All right. So uh, with that, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. And uh, so on to general business and appearances. It's an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, comment on something that is otherwise not on our agenda. And <clears throat> if you have something to say that's relevant to something that's on the agenda, there'll be an opportunity to do that sort of more adjacent to uh, that item. And uh, as is also true for those other public comments, if you would uh, say your name, where you live, and uh, try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be excellent. Uh, all right, do we have any takers? Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. I wanna just call your attention that the appointment to the CVPSA is somewhat urgent there's a lot of complicated matters and misinformation flying in all directions you were asked at the last meeting and you tabled it to appoint a city official because the discussion has gone on that the cities need to be more engaged uh without having we need somebody of intelligence and integrity and without her permission i would nominate uh donna barlow casey because you need, she manages the radio system, uh, not directly, but she has to keep, stay in touch with all her trucks. Uh, so that's something worth considering, but it's, we, we entered this contract, this, this uh, authority, which is a contract chartered by the legislature. And it says an appointment for a vacancy will be made in 45 days. That would have been from Dan's resignation letter took effect August 25th you had until October 11th to appoint uh, a replacement for Dan. He was doing due diligence there. That that was essential. Uh, now we're near a month. Tomorrow is a month past that. So, you know, we, we, we're not outlaws. We, we have to, you know, adhere to our contracts and take seriously the important work that, that needs to get done there to get budgets ready to find out what radio system parts might fail and buy spares, et cetera. I call your attention to changing subject to the article in seven days in VPR about the rental problems. I've attended some of the housing task force and the homelessness task force and at various, we have a problem in this city that's not unlike Burlington's problem with the Bow brothers that we don't have the enforcement or inspection mechanisms in place to actually uh, support those housing task force initiatives, inventorying the B&Bs, finding the code violations, figuring out where public investment should go. We need to take that uh, much more seriously and uh, ramp up the enforcement and inspection. Uh, when I've called multiple issues of sewage flowing out in, in basements, uh, it all just gets treated at, you know, as if it's, a, it's, it's normal routine business. That's not okay. You know, it's, it's not okay at all. So, uh, I think I reused up my two minutes without hitting two other topics, but maybe you could actually consider putting some of the things that I bring to your attention because they are well-researched, putting them on the agenda and talking about them rather than trying to get me to, you know, allow you two minutes of annoyance so you can sweep it under the rug for another few months. Thank you. Anyone else who is here in public wish to make a comment? Oh, in person, I guess that's what I meant. <laughs> in public. Uh, I, I'm not seeing anyone. Anyone online? I'm not seeing any hands online, um, but you could uh, turn your camera on and wave, or you could uh, use the raise hand uh, reaction if you wanted, but I'm not seeing anyone uh, digitally either. Uh, so we are going to move on then on to the consent agenda. 
Um, and with the consent agenda, um, just a, a question about the addition, John, is there any, um, anything we should know about uh, the addition of payroll and, um, it was it payroll and bills? Payrolls and bill, bills, it's on every time. Okay. And it just wasn't on this okay. time. All right. Um, any other, yes, Jack. And then the consent agenda. I'll second it. Okay, and, and is it including the payroll and bills? Yes. Okay, and that's okay with you, Donna? Yes. Okay. Um, any further discussion about the consent agenda? Um, I just, I don't want to pull it off the agenda. I just want to make a comment that uh, the uh, Raise the Blade initiative is something that uh, has been, um, that folks from the Conservation Commission have been working on and just delighted to see that our staff was very supportive of that, um, which is uh, an initiative about uh, mowing higher. So you actually, uh, like three inches up, um, literally like raising the blade of mowing, uh, which ends up, you, you end up with better water retention and soil health. Uh, and uh, so anyway, just glad that that's there. Um, and uh, yeah, no need, to, no need to pull it. So any other comments? Okay, uh, uh, all those in uh, any further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes and now we're on to um, I believe the presentation um, from the Agency of Natural Resources and I, I see some folks here from uh, ANR so welcome. Yes, yes. And I'll let you introduce yourself and if you need a minute. We'll kind of split it. Yeah. I have a um, I have a presentation on my computer. I'm happy to share it. Um, should I just plug in my computer or I'm gonna let you talk to Cameron about that and it sounds like maybe we could just like take a minute um, yeah, for, I can, for I that. Can, yeah, I can provide some overview remarks. Okay, sure. <laughs> But Peter's talking now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for having us, uh, Madam Mayor, Councilors. Um, I, my name is Peter Walk. I am the Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, Montpelier resident. I'm joined by Nick Gianetti, another Montpelier resident who is the head of our pre treatment program in the wastewater program uh, within the DEC. Um, can I pause a second? We're getting a, some signal that it's hard to hear um, in the back. So I just want to give. Um, pause yeah in the in the room let's see yeah try it again is this any better yes great okay. thank you so much i usually do not have trouble for projecting so i will <laughs> i will do better uh <laughs> um so thank you for having us uh we uh are here at the request of the council to discuss um, the issues related to per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, otherwise known as PFAS, a class or excuse me, a grouping of chemicals about 4,000 strong uh, that are in various products and uses around all around us. They're in our it's they've been used in our clothing and our furniture and our carpets and our ski wax and our firefighting foam for decades. Uh, we as a as a global society are frank are coming to knowledge of these chemicals way too late for Vermont's experience it started with in 2016 when uh, across our border our southwestern border in the town of Hoosick Falls or the village of Hoosick Falls uh, PFA or PFOA PFOA one of the chemicals was discovered in the water system in Hoosick Falls that led, there was a um, uh, fabric coating factory in Hoosick Falls that led to local discussions in and around Bennington to discuss what was happening there because there was a very similar factory there. And so we are actually on Monday going down to celebrate the, the final extension of waterline systems in Bennington to cover the more than 380 impacted residences from PFAS in the in the groundwater that flowed into drinking water wells in Bennington. That is the frankly sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of where PFAS exists in our society. Um, and we are doing our best to respond 
to where those come from. Uh, what you are seeing here relative to Casella's leachate and from the News VT facility is the result of our waste stream, right? It is, it is the things that we all collectively throw away coming back to us. It doesn't, it doesn't, we, it's not going away. Um, we have done a number of things to protect Vermont residents, red, residents over time. There are drinking water standards in place. We are working on surface water standards. There are uh, cleanup standards in place that we use. We are working with partners around the country to identify ways to better test for and understand where PFAS come from and where they live and how we treat them. Um, and I think maybe most importantly for the residents of Vermont and Montpelier included is that we have two uh, have moved forward with litigation in two cases against manufacturers of these chemicals to hold them accountable for the, the, the problems that they have caused. It is our perspective that they should have known or did know that these chemicals were harmful before they entered our stream of commerce. And so we, as community members in this state and elsewhere around the country, need the resources to be able to address them. These are not naturally occurring chemicals. Any, any level of PFAS is not a natural, not a natural source. And so what, what Nick is gonna go through now is sort of the nature of the pretreatment permit that we just, uh, the draft permit that we just issued or that we put out for public comment uh, for the news VT facility that um, that seeks to over the course of time install full treatment on that leachate. There's a process for that, and it's one that's going to take some time. The treatment techniques are fairly well known, but managing the process, understanding what to do with the residuals, the end of the process because putting it directly back in the landfill is not a great idea because it's just going to come out again in the form of leachate. We have to work through all those things. And, and so that's the, that's what we're here to talk to you today and answer your questions. Um, I'm happy to turn it over to Nick. Thank you. And I'm going to move so I can see your presentation. Okay. Can you folks see it on the zoom screen? Okay, I can share my screen. Sorry about that. Okay, can everyone see that online and on your computers? Cool. Thanks for having me and thanks for working with me through that little tech hiccup there. Uh, my name is Nick Giannetti. I'm the pretreatment section supervisor for the Vermont DEC. Um, the pretreatment sections in the wastewater management program in the watershed management division. And the wastewater program is, is broken up into two sections. There's the direct discharge section, which regulates discharges of wastewaters directly to surface waters. Then there's the pretreatment section, which focuses on discharges coming into those municipal wastewater plants that are direct that are directly discharging to surface waters. And the pretreatment program is really in a unique position to focus on the reduction of pollutants. Um, that are coming into those wastewater plants and, and the goals of, of the program are really to um, protect those wastewater plants from adverse impact from certain pollutants. Um, protect surface waters from pass from pollutants that may pass through the wastewater plant enter the surface water. And um, protect biosolids that are produced by by municipal wastewater treatment facilities, specifically the quality of those biosolids. So um, this is a presentation we've been giving at the public meetings that we've been holding for this permit. Um, it, it runs through the major, um, the major kind of buckets that are in the permit, the, the major conditions that, that apply to the regulation of, of the leachate discharge at the Montpelier Wastewater Treatment Facility. 
So I'm just going to kind of go touch upon those major conditions and um, then we'll open it up to questions. Before you get very far, you're not seeing that on our Zoom screens. Dude. Okay. There's something different about how it's, uh, what mode you're in on the PowerPoint maybe. Sorry about that. This isn't my computer. <laughs> Yes, go for it. Um, it says I am sharing. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Yes, I should have done a trial run with you. Okay. We're all struggling through this post pandemic life together. Yep. You have a captive audience. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just held two public meetings for this permit, and it was the same type of hybrid in-person situation and yeah there's definitely a steep learning curve with with managing that for sure sharing your screen and turn off the notification view so hopefully this will work i say hopefully okay i feel like i've done all the things i know how to do <laughs> That is showing on the screen. Last time this messed up really bad. We just flip through the slides. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think that's what she just turned off. Maybe we can just blow these up. Yeah. You guys can see the, the PowerPoint is open though, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll just go low tech. Yeah, I think we'll we'll just we'll do it like this. Can everyone is that large enough for everyone on the computer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So yeah, this is so you know we're here today to talk about the renewal for the New England Waste Services or NEWS pretreatment permit, and that permit regulates the discharge of landfill leachate from three landfills. That's the New England Waste Services of Vermont landfill in Coventry, Vermont, the North Country Environmental Services landfill in Bethlehem, New Hampshire and the Central Vermont Landfill in East Montpelier, Vermont. This permit regulates the discharge of leachate from those landfills to Vermont Municipal Wastewater Treatment Facilities. It's currently on public notice through November 24th, and it will be effective for five years once um, approved and, and issued by the secretary. Um, there is an opportunity to amend the permit when, when it is after it is effective. Um, and this this particular discharge has been permitted since 1994 with the agency, um, permitted the discharge to the city of Montpelier since 1994. So, um, yeah, so this permit is, is really, um, it permits, like I said, the discharge of leachate to the Montpelier wastewater treatment facility. In the permit, we've specified limits on the volume and the amount of BOD or biochemical oxygen demand that can be present in the leachate and discharged to the Montpelier Wastewater Treatment Facility. 
the volume and, and BOD limits are based on the allocation issued from the city to the permittee. And um, the way the pretreatment permit program works is for the state to issue a pretreatment permit, or the state's pretreatment permits are based on the approval, the municipal approval of that discharge to their wastewater treatment facility. We can't permit a discharge to a municipal wastewater plant if the city hasn't approved it. Um, and we, we won't you know, make a city accept a wastewater discharge um, from an industrial user or, or from, from a, a source. Um, so, so it's you know the city's decision or any municipality's decision to accept the discharge. They would issue that approval, or sometimes it's called an allocation letter, where they issue um, they allocate a particular amount of flow that that entity can discharge to the wastewater plant, as well as BOD in some cases. Um, and we adopt that as part of our permit, and we would issue a permit for any discharge to a municipality that has the potential to adversely impact the wastewater plant. And being that this is leachate, there's a lot of stuff in leachate. If it's not managed appropriately, it can adversely impact the wastewater plant or the receiving waters or the biosolids quality. That's why we have a permit for this. And um, you know, the major changes in this renewal are the removal of the Newport wastewater treatment plant, the Barry wastewater treatment plant, the Burlington North wastewater treatment plant and the Essex Junction wastewater treatment plant from the permit. Um, so currently Montpelier is the only uh, municipality on the permit that's um, accepting leachate under this permit. And those other discharge points were removed for various reasons. Um, you know, some of you may be aware of the moratorium in Newport, um, the Act 250 moratorium, which um, you know, doesn't allow leachate to be received at the Newport wastewater treatment plant any longer. Um, some of these other municipalities um, did not renew their agreement with with the permittee, um, or some some of these municipalities um, don't have the um, infrastructure at their wastewater plant to receive leachate anymore. So therefore, as part of this renewal, they were removed from the discharge permit. Another change in this permit is the um, the change to the flow limit. The previous flow limit was um, 23,000 gallons per day, but there was a provision in the permit that allowed the landfill to exceed that flow limit so long as the BOD met the BOD standard. The landfill's leachate was cons consistently met the BOD standard. Therefore, essentially, there was no flow limit, and they could discharge as much volume of leachate as they wanted to the wastewater treatment plant, so long as it maintained um, that 1,200 pounds per day BOD. We put a cap on the volume of leachate that they can bring to the wastewater plant. That cap is 60,000 gallons per day, um, and that's based on, again, the approval from the city to the, to the landfill. We adopted that approval in this permit. We're requiring um, pretty extensive leachate monitoring of the leachate in this permit. Sorry if that's blurry. Um, we're requiring monitoring of conventional pollutants such as BOD, total suspended solids. We're requiring monitoring of metals. Um, there's the suite of priority pollutant metals which have been included in the permit in the past. We've also added some new metals, total aluminum, total iron, total molybdenum. We're now requiring monitoring for nutrients, total phosphorus and total nitrogen, given the concerns with total phosphorus and the nutrient impairment in the Lake Champlain Basin. We're requiring monitoring for priority pollutants, which are a suite of toxic pollutants that include toxic organics, um, semi-volatile semi organic compounds, pesticides, PCBs, and we're also requiring um, monthly monitoring for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS, which as you folks know, are an emerging contaminant. Another new requirement of this draft permit is enhanced monitoring at the municipal wastewater treatment facility. So at the city of Montpelier wastewater plant, 
the purpose of this monitoring is to assess the impact of the leachate on the wastewater treatment plant's operations, determine how well the wastewater plant is removing pollutants from the leachate, and monitoring the impact of leachate on the wastewater plant's effluent quality and its discharge to surface waters. So we're requiring um, you know, a variety of different types of testing, or PFAS testing quarterly, which would be in the influent, so coming into the plant, the effluent coming out of the plant, and the solids produced by the plant. Requiring quarterly monitoring of influent, effluent, and solids for metals. Two times per year monitoring of um, the other priority pollutants that I mentioned, or the organic compounds, PCBs, pesticides. Um, and we're also requiring um, twice per year monitoring of whole effluent toxicity testing or wet testing. And wet testing is a test that um, determines the toxicity of the effluent of the wastewater plant. Um, it, it exposes the effluent at various concentrations to fish and um, Daphnia or water flea, um, and it determines the toxicity of, of the effluent. So we're increasing the monitoring for wet testing as well. Another new monitoring requirement in this permit is um, in stream at the Winooski River. This monitoring is required three times per year above the outfall of the wastewater plant and below the outfall of the wastewater plant. Um, this monitoring is required for PFAS. Um, this is in addition to the state monitoring in stream receiving water monitoring that, that we're currently doing. And this would be routine monitoring. So this would be expected for the life of the permit or for this permit term. And um, the purpose of this monitoring is to determine concentrations of PFAS in surface waters that are attributable to the discharge determine if those concentrations pose risk to accumulating in fish at levels that um, pose risk to human health. And as part of this permit, we're requiring specific sampling methodology, specific sample points, and specific collection procedures to ensure accurate and representative data is collected and um, to be consistent with the state's um, statewide surface water monitoring strategy. The final condition I'll review is the requirement for the permittee to implement a pilot system to treat leachate. The goals of that condition are for the permittee to explore a um, treatment system for PFAS, um, to remove PFAS in its leachate. Um, they would explore a pilot system with the goal to establish a full scale treatment system over time. The goals of the study, of the pilot study particularly, are to establish design criteria for a full-scale treatment system. Through our review of that pilot study, we would be reviewing it to ensure that it's properly designed, operated, and maintained to provide consistent and reliable treatment of that leachate. Another goal of the study is to provide the agency the necessary information for us to develop a treatment standard or a technology-based affluent limit for us to limit PFAS in, le in leachate um, across the state. So those are the goals of the pilot study. The timeline, within four months from the effective date of the permit, we anticipate receiving a plan outlining the details of the pilot study. That plan would, would outline the technology that the permittee is looking at piloting, the, the monitoring plan um, that, that the permittee will implement to collect various operational performance, economic, environmental data to determine how the pilot, the effectiveness of the pilot study. It will also um, outline the location of the pilot study. And that plan, we're, we're planning to treat that plan as a um, amendment to the permit. So when we receive that plan, we're gonna put it on public notice and um, that will be subject to public review and comment and, and feedback. And we would consider that um, upon um, amending the permit to incorporate the plan. After the plan is approved, within one year, the permittee would implement the pilot study and begin the data collection phase 
two years from that, they would report out on the pilot study findings with the final report. We're asking for quarterly progress reports throughout the duration of the study so we can keep our finger on the pulse and review data as it's collected. And as I mentioned before, following the report, um, our intention is to determine a, an implementation schedule for the installation of a full-scale treatment system and um, to develop the uh, applicable treatment standards for, for that treatment system. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and overview of the permit, and I'm happy to take questions. This is Peter again. I just want to uh, just kind of anchor on the point that, that Nick made about in-stream monitoring. We've done some already um, a couple years ago. You know, we've got some more going on. And obviously, if this uh, permit goes into effect, it will have ongoing monitoring to understand what the in-stream impacts are uh, from all sources of PFAS to the wastewater treatment facility. And so that's a, a piece that I think we, we, we thought was very important and we pushed for not to be the burden of the city of Montpelier because it, it needs to reside with, with the pre-treatment permittee. Um, but uh, wanted to make sure that everybody sort of heard that piece loud and clear. Thank you. Um, so I just wanna clarify the process from here. Sorry, I didn't um, articulate this earlier, but um, if council has questions um, for uh, Nick or for Peter, um, now would be a good time. But I do want to also, after we have clarifying questions, then I hear from the public, uh, folks want to make comments, and then we'll go back to um, council discussion. Um, so, but first, uh, any questions um, from council? Yeah. Yeah. But thanks so much, guys. Um, so, like, yeah, I think collectively we all have some responsibility for you know, leachate and PFAS and put it in the water and everything. I, I guess what I'm wondering is, we're the only municipality doing this now. So by having this the one discharge point, are we disproportionately putting both our community at risk and maybe this region at risk by being the only ones who accept this and discharging into the water, like right here in Montpelier? Um, so, so yeah, that is correct that you're the only permit, you're the only municipality receiving leachate from this particular permittee. There are other municipalities in the state that, are, that do receive leachate from other sources. Um, yeah, as part of this permit issuance, um, you know, we, we do an analysis to look at the quality of the leachate um, and how that impacts your wastewater plant and how it impacts the effluent quality and the surface water that's receiving that discharge. And um, you know, for the conventional pollutants, priority pollutants, metals, nutrients that I, that I reviewed in the permit, um, you know, the the agency, you know, there's there's not a reasonable potential for that discharge to adversely impact the surface waters. So that that's why we're we're allowed to issue this permit because there we're not. Um, you know, we did not find an adverse impact to surface waters or a, um, you know, any violation of the water quality standards as part of your municipality receiving this leachate. Does the department have a position one way or the other, if we accept it or not? Like, do you want us to keep accepting it or? <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna be straight up. <laughs> I'm not gonna make Nick What's answer. It worth? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna make Nick, I mean, for the most part, we do not. Um, the, I think, the challenge that I see is that, like many of these instances, we are simply going, the problem isn't going to go away. Uh, News VT already sends some of its landfill leachate to the treatment center in in Plattsburgh. And so if, if, if Montpelier were to refuse to accept it, then it would just go there and it would end up in our shared water body again. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I fully understand the concerns and we, sh we share those. Obviously that's why we're looking forward around the state. Um, it's not, it's, it's one of those squeeze one part of the balloon and the air just goes somewhere else kind of situations where it's not gonna solve it for, for the rest of society. And so I, I do understand, but no, I, I mean, I, 
this is a municipal decision as to whether to accept the OHA. All right, go ahead, Donna. I, I had a question about your pilot study. Uh, one, would that be us? And, and, and nowhere else is this already not being dealt with in a way that we can look at and examine and pattern after? Sure, I'll, I'll start next and then you can go. So, so the the treatment system, the treatment pilot is required to be done by the permittee, which in this case is News VT, not the City of Montpelier. the The treatment systems for PFAS exist, right? We've we've used them in different capacities, you know, and we had Casella do an engineering evaluation of, of of a few different treatment technologies. We had a third party look at them. The treatment systems exist. It's how to manage the entire process, right? What happens to so when you treat for PFAS, the PFAS doesn't go away; it just gets super concentrated. What do you then do with that concentrated PFAS? Putting it back in the landfill doesn't seem like a great idea because then it's just going to come back in the the landfill leach again. If we solidify it so that it it can't leach out as easily, then we create capacity issues in the landfill because we're solidifying a bunch of takes a lot of solid to to fill up that. So there's a lot of things to try to figure out along the way um, that goes from scaling a fairly basic treatment process to treating uh, you know thousands of gallons a day of landfill leach. So if I'm understanding it, you said there's we know how to treat it, but we don't. We still have a residue, even though we've now reduced the volume. We still have this residue. It's like nuclear power. So it's you know it's so the one of the treatment systems that we 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 would use we could use is a reverse osmosis system. You know, very similar to how we make in maple syrup these days, where we super concentrate the syrup on one side and the water goes out the other. The sort of same thing could be a, a feature we use and what you do with that super concentrated liquid is important right and we need to man manage it one of the challenges that we have as an agency and we have as a society is that we haven't really come up with good ways to destroy this chemical yet and so what we do how we pursue that destruction in the long run is really important uh or you know manage it because it's it's in, it's in firefighting foam. It's designed to resist high temperatures. And so, you know, typically we would do things like, you know, thermal destruction of these sorts of chemicals. And we're not sure if what, to what extent or when that occurs, because the research isn't, isn't there enough at this point to understand what those effects are. Because nowhere else have they come to any resolution on this either you're telling there we are we are well ahead of most places on on all of these issues and, and the only other thing about the pilot it just seems a long time and I mean three months a year to three years I mean that's a lot of stuff being blown out uh, is is that recommended by the experts I mean how do you get such a long timeline there's no way to get it more condensed or is that money? So yeah, the, the pilot study, it's right now is proposed for a duration of two years. And that study would occur over two years. And the reason why we wanted to do it over two years is because um, you know, we wanted the, the treatments, we wanted to stress test this treatment system, right? Like the treatment system is gonna be subject to different hydraulic, different flows, different conditions such as temperature. Um, you know, seasonal conditions, things like that. We wanted to make sure that there was enough time to, for the treatment system to operate under those different seasonal conditions and demonstrate that it can perform effectively. Okay, but you can see my worry. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Jay, did I see your hand? Oh, okay, over, over here. Yeah, go ahead, Warren. Yeah, thank you. Um, Really appreciate you being here and all the work you're doing. And you know, as as you can imagine, we're hearing from lots and lots of concerned residents, um, hearing from people from all over the state. In fact, hearing lots of concerns, especially in Newport and other parts of the state. Um, you know, and I think we can all agree that the current system is a total mess and a fundamental failure. Just 
putting these leachate out into the river. And I appreciate that you all are really, you know, talking to lots of colleagues all over the country, like Vermont really is at the cutting edge. And I appreciate that you all are pushing and trying to get this pretreatment technology. I was just on a call earlier today with people wrestling with this in states around the nation. So just acknowledging that, you know, it's, it's a suite of bad options. It's a terrible situation. Um, and, you know, really glad to hear that there's litigation underway to go after the chemical companies who are the ones who manufactured this, profited off of it, and now we're all dealing with all of these issues. Um, just a couple questions about the, the permit. Um, just curious, why, why in this scenario, um, you know, there was the, the engineering study, and why is Casella being given the, like, essentially deference to come up with the plan instead of you all just looking at okay we've got this data here's like coming up with more details of the plan and having more say over what it is um you know i'm glad to hear that it's going to be out for public comment um, but just curious what the rationale is behind that piece i'll, I'll start and then nick can go to from my perspective it's it has to be a plan that they implement ultimately and so certainly we have considerable interest in what that plan looks like which is why we need to approve it uh, but ultimately it has to be a process by which they know how to manage it and can do it we will work hand in hand, in hand with them to develop that plan so that it's effective and as nick said we can stress test it but i do understand that that reads as a concern to me that reads as ownership of the challenge um, and we are the over you know oversight for that effort if you want anything um thanks that's good to hear that you'll be working closely in developing it so it's not just i mean obviously knowing that you all have a certain mission and charge to protect public health the environment and casilla has a different mission um just knowing that that oversight and working together um just curious about the other chemicals i mean so obviously we're very concerned about pfas um, but there's you know hundreds of chemicals who knows in in leachate um how you know is there how much i saw that there was like one list in the presentation of of some of those that are being tested like i mean do you have a sense that the pretreatment would probably be getting at a lot of those or are there other chemicals we should really be concerned about beyond pfas um i don't know nick if you have specifics but generally speaking when we're treating for pfas Pretty much need to get rid of everything else first because PFAS is present in such tiny amounts that if you treated it, if you didn't sort of pre treat in the pre treatment process for some of your more present chemicals that are larger in, in quantity, you wouldn't, you would clog up your filters way too quickly with everything else. And so, the and those. So there's going to be a lot of work that will have lots of benefits because the the filtration the filtration chain should deal with many constituents that are in the leaching. That's encouraging. A couple more. Yeah, go um, for it. Yeah. So the just curious the thinking behind just doing quarterly testing in Montpelier. So knowing that we're going to be the one off taker in Vermont at this point. Um, you know, like one test a season seems really small for a data set. Is, is there a rationale behind that? Or, or I would, I guess, urge more testing? <laughs> um, Isn't monthly? Yeah, we're, we're happy um, to consider more testing. So if you do want more testing, I encourage you to make a public comment on that. But, you know, the, the rationale is really that um, you know, Montpelier, so we're, we're requiring monthly testing of the leachate. Um, we're requiring quarterly testing at the city of Montpelier. Montpelier receives various sources that are not just the leachate, of, of PFAS that are not just the leachate. Um, so, you know, we, we didn't think it was necessary to, um, we, we thought quarterly monitoring would be sufficient to, to characterize the, the um, amount of PFAS in, in the influent, effluent, and, and solids at, at the wastewater treatment facility. Um, you know, it's more testing than any other wastewater plant around the state is doing currently. Um, and that is something that we're considering for other municipalities. But, um, 
yeah, quarterly monitoring is, is what we've recommended as part of the permit. And that's consistent with, um, if you look at the Massachusetts NIPTES permits and, and how they're, um, what they're requiring of, of their municipalities, it's, it's consistent with that monitoring schedule. Gotcha. Um, and, and if I saw it right, we're just testing for the five PFAS, not all of the PFAS that we can detect using the EPA? No, we're testing for, um, you know, the, the number always changes. Um, I believe it's 36 um, compounds, um, but that would include the five regulated compounds as well as um, other precursors and, and, and PFAS compounds as well. Um, and currently, there are no approved methods for PFOS. So currently we're prescribing that, um, it's called EPA's modified method 537 to use for PFOS and, and that can detect, I believe it's 36 compounds. Um, but once, a mod once an approved method is adopted by the EPA, we're requiring that that method be utilized. And EPA is looking at that method. They have a draft method currently um, released and they're, they're taking comment on that draft method and um, I believe that that analyzes 40 compounds, mm -hmm. um, recognizing that there's thousands of these. That's kind of where we're at right now with, with um, our ability in, in wastewater monitoring. Just one or two more. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Um, would, so I saw that part of our permit is taking out of state leachate and I know that you know, part of what we've talked about is, well, we're all part of the Vermont waste system. I imagine there's interstate commerce clause issues, but is there a way for us? I mean, it's us importing out of state leachate just doesn't sit well. Just does, why is that part of our permit? Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's been part of the permit for, I believe it was 2000. I think it was 2004 that was included on the permit. I can double check that, but um, that's been part of the permit for some years now. Um, and there is an interstate commerce clause that um, is at play there. I, do you want to speak more on that? Sure. I mean, that's always a complicated issue, right? The 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 way we typically uh, deal with issues of uh, associated with so we don't accept waste into the state of Vermont unless it meets the requirements that all of our municipalities through the solid waste management districts and other entities meet, and nobody takes us up on that. Um, and so we would need to. This is essentially putting the same sorts of requirements on. Vermont created leachate. And so I, I think it would be a challenge from my perspective to for interstate commerce clause issues, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, I'm not gonna tread too, too far into that one. Fair enough. And my last question was um, just one of the proposals that we're looking at for the next phase of our water resource recovery facility is um, drying biosolids, and there was some hope that there might be a market for them. I've just been assuming that as of right now with the leachate that it's pretty PFAS contaminated biosolids, so there wouldn't be much of a market for that, and we shouldn't be spreading that around. Um, so I'm just curious if there's any thoughts on how we should be thinking about the biosolids as long as we are continuing to take PFAS contaminated leachate and potential markets. Yeah, you know, leachate is a large source of PFAS, and a lot of that PFAS in the wastewater plant goes to the biosolids. It, it, it likes the solids. Um, and those solids, you know, they can be managed a few different ways. Um, Montpelier brings their solids to the landfill, um, but the other management strategies include land application um, or um, if there's sufficient treatment of the biosolids, they can be re, um, used as compost um, and, and given out to the public. Um, and PFAS is a huge concern in, in land application of biosolids, particularly, and um, the distribution of biosolids used as compost and, and for, for the public. It's, it's definitely a huge concern. Um, and, you know, with, with the land application, there are, there's 
limitations on the groundwater. So if, if biosolids were going to be applied to that site, um, there would, you know, the, the um, permittee that was applying those would need to do testing of the soil and the groundwater to, to monitor the levels of PFAS in, in that, um, that are, are being contributed to those two medias via the biosolids. Um, so, so that, that would be, you know, the, the, the limiting, the, the limiting factor for land application. Um, I don't know what, if there are any limits in PFAS for um, biosolids that are distributed as, as compost. Um, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, just because that's a different program. Um, so we have started just in this past legislative session, the Agency of Agriculture regulates those biosolids that, that become what we call exceptional quality. Uh, that have been treated in some way, shape, or form, and then simply come back as, excuse me, then simply come back as, as soil amendments. Um, and they have been given authority by the legislature to, re to require testing of, of those uh, soil amendments. And so they're in the process of working on that now, but it is, you, you have identified, you know, identified part of the challenge, right? We have this system in place that uses com commercial goods or in, you know, consumer goods with PFAS in them that end up in our waste stream. And part of that waste stream is the biosolids at the, at the tail end of it. Um, well, and then it recycles through, but yeah, so that's, but I would also say that for every wastewater treatment facility we've tested, there's PFAS present in the, in the influent, in the effluent. Um, and so your your sources are not if if the city were to stop taking it your sources of PFAS would not disappear entirely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, I've got a few questions. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Sure. Thanks, Ann. Um, feel free to correct me if I've missed something, but I'm just trying to wrap my head a little bit around the timeline here. Um, Nick, I think you did a really good job of sort of laying out exactly what the feedback loop is in terms of um, testing, technology development, et cetera, um, <clears throat> to be able to, to deal with the PFAS that are coming out of the leachate. But kind of best case scenario is that two years, there's at least a proposal to be able to deal with it. Like we've, we've got to that point where at that point there, you know, we could look at new technologies that could, could deal with it. But this is all relative to um, essentially just working with one vendor, right? So along the way, if deadlines aren't met along that way, it could get extended, right? So I'm just trying to wrap my head around like timeline what we're looking at here in terms of, you know, the position that we take as a city, but knowing like expectations around um, just you know how long if, if we were to if we, if we were to sign on and 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 engage you know and, and be positive around this this new permit and everything that ha you know that that goes on then you know what exactly are we looking at as a city in terms of what we discharge into our rivers yep so Thanks. four months from the issuance of the permit we'd have the proposal the plan and that plan would be subject to state review and public comment following the approval of that plan um, within one year of the effective date of the permit the the pilot study would begin and then there would be a two-year testing period um, and so at year three of the permit um, we're looking at a completed pilot study and final report for review following that it's the agency's intention to develop treatment standards and an implementation schedule for the full scale treatment of leachate. I, I can't say right now how long that would take, um, but but those are the dates that that we have presented in the in the near term or the short term timeline. So uh, one follow up question to that: uh, If the city of Montpelier stops taking leachate. Does that mean that the pilot study doesn't happen? So this pretreatment only applies for permitted facilities in the state of Vermont. So if, if, yeah. 
you, there are no state of Vermont facilities that are accepting leachate, then the options for Casella are out of state and therefore would be subject to New York or New Hampshire or whoever's requirements under their pretreatment program. We would not be able to put any conditions on that leachate. Okay. Um, and you might have alluded to this earlier, but just to be clear, um, are there any, so right now there's this effluent leachate coming out of a landfill and we're the, the general tactic right now is to put it into wastewater treatment um, facilities. Are there other ways of dealing with PFAS besides just like, and maybe maybe this is like the solids you were talking about. Um, there there are other ways to deal with to I will say temporarily deal with PFAS once you've separated it out from everything else. Okay. To solidify the volume of leachate that they create on a daily basis would be impractical to the running of the to the the creation and operation of a landfill. So, and, and still wouldn't resolve the issue because the PFAS would just still exist in a different form. Right. Um, so it's there, it, it, it requires, it requires treatment and the con, you know, condensing of that material to the point where it can be managed in a, in a way that doesn't, that, you know, essentially shut the landfill down because we're filling it up with solidified leachate, if that makes sense. Yep. yep. Um, okay, and one further question, something that I feel like I've heard from constituents is that they want to know where uh, this is coming into their lives. Uh, are there products they should not be buying, uh, etc. And I'm guessing the answer is no to this, but I just want to confirm. Uh, there are there any um, initiatives at the legislative level or at the department level or uh, anywhere uh, that would potentially uh, require disclosure uh, that this is applied to a product, you know, that it's in the ski wax, that it's in, you know, it's, it's on this couch, but it's not on that couch, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so the, uh, the legislature actually went beyond that this year okay. and for certain products, not all products that contain PFAS, they required those, they mandated that those products not be made for sale in the state of Vermont. Okay. So, so that was carpets intentionally added to, I'm going to look to Lauren for a little help here. <laughs> um, excuse me. That's a little hurl. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh ski waxes uh firefighting foam um carpets what else am i missing? it was uh food packaging carpets in like indoor residential carpets rugs and like stain treatments yeah. and um the firefighting foam and ski wax some of these are phased in over the next couple of years so it, i mean it's really hard to tell because there isn't labeling um but some things now are saying PFAS free um, because there's been consumer demand. So, you know, you can certainly look for that. Um, you know, I think there's still like pots and pans and stuff that are Teflon coated, but so stainless steel or, you know, things that are not the like non-stick surface right. kind of thing. Um, are those in, are the, I'm sorry to interrupt, are the like the non-stick pans, are those included in the, the phase out or are those Those that were not yet covered. Okay. California just passed, I believe, a ban on cookware. Okay. I don't know when that goes into effect, but that just got signed into law like a couple weeks ago. Okay. So that could drive the market. Yeah. But um, so it's not on all products. But then it's in apparel, like your yeah. Gore-Tex, waterproof things. And, um, you know, it's used in a lot of different things. So there's still more, there's still more product categories that have not been covered. Yep. Okay. And so that, and, and so you're getting to the point, Madam Mayor, of, of turning off the spigot, so to speak, yeah. of sources into our waste stream. It's, there's still a sort of big use of, you know, when we 
when the city decides to replace these chairs or this carpet or what have you, that's going to go into the landfill and that more than likely has PFAS. So that, it, that you know, the life cycle of those products is pretty long. And so they're going to continue for some time. And we also have to think about what's already in the landfill. Um, so it, yeah, you can understand why yeah. we're trying to tackle this problem from both ends of, of the issue. Yeah. And I, I would add that there are, there are limited things that the state of Vermont can do or that any state can do as a way to control the use of, of chemicals as part of the update to the Toxic Substance Control Act, which is a federal law. There were certain sort of things that preempted state action, but this, but EPA under the previous administration wasn't really taking much in the way of action. And so it allowed for states to, to take some action. So there's still some question about sort of where that's going, but I am pleased to say that in our discussions with the, the current EPA administrator, uh, the six New England states sent a letter to, to the incoming administrator when he first started basically saying, here's our wish list of all the things we need you to do relative to PFAS. And I am happy to say that the that he appointed then the, the person who runs our, our regional EPA office in New England as the co-chair of his PFAS council that's just come out with their action plan. And it it is going to take what was a sort of slow, deliberate process and really ramp it up. And we're excited to see that. And you know, finding out more information on the toxicity of different chemicals, finding out more information on chemicals, being able to test for more than just the suite of 36 we can test for now. Um, there's a lot of good stuff happening, and we're pleased to see a, a response from uh, federal partners stepping up. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Okay. So at this point, uh, if the public has thoughts, questions, concerns, um, I'd like to raise now is the time. I'm going to start with people who are in person, uh, and then we'll go to folks who are uh, with us digitally. Anyone in person wish to make a comment? <clears throat> if you say your name, where you live, and try to keep your comments about two minutes. Yeah, yeah I just have a question. My name is Brad Appel, live in Montpelier. Um, I'm just wondering about a financial impact to uh, so if we give this permit, if we don't give the permit, they're going to have to take leachate and send it to New York or somewhere else. That is probably more expensive than are we trying to get ahead of a fine? Is it cheaper for us to permit this or you get my question? I'm, I'm wondering how that how the finance impacts there. Sure. That's all. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Uh, well, I'm not going to answer the city's finance question. The only financial benefit the state of Vermont gets is the payment for the permit application itself, and so that's not of significant of significant interest to us. We're you know we're agnostic as to whether people will apply for permits, but um, I understand they're at payment for their acceptance of that of that leachate uh, from from News VT to the city. I see. Okay. And they do pay the city of Montpelier. Uh, Castella pays the city of Montpelier to accept leachate. Uh, all right. Anyone else? Um, the question is how much? Well, it was not made into. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you have a public comment, now would be a good time. Go yeah. ahead. How much is the economic impact to Montpelier if we stop taking poison? Is we, that any, anything else you want to say? Oh, yeah. Okay, I have a lot I, more to say. I, I would recommend that you do it now then. Well, I was trying to follow on we'll, that. We'll answer that question. So it seems like we're treating Casella with kid gloves here. Uh, you know, for why aren't we requiring their plan before we even issue the permit? You know, they're making profits off of this stuff and obviously great profits because they're paying great monies to Montpelier to take it. But we're, we're setting Montpelier up to be the PFAS poison capital of New England. Uh, you know, poison for profit. It's it's immoral. Uh, the one year pilot pro project to to not even have uh, an actionable treatment solution for two, three, four years out, and if it doesn't get kicked further down the road, is unconscionable. Um, how do we compare? Have we done a side by side analysis of how New York's going to regulate it 
if we do stop taking it. They may be stricter than, than Vermont, you know? Uh, why, why haven't we heard about the, the impacts on the lake? Or what about treating it at an oceanside treatment plant where it's being much more dilute than being, dumping it into Lake Champlain? I mean, it doesn't seem like we've done due diligence here. Uh, quarterly sampling versus weekly or monthly. It, it seems like certain pockets of this stuff are gonna come out uh, and we should put out warnings when, when, when not to swim in the river or not eat fish, but we're, we're feeding fish, which are eat, being eaten by, you know, ducks and, and herons and eagles, you know, we're passing this stuff around as if it were okay. And, it, and it's not okay. Um, how do we compare the effluent to tolerable concentrations to our drinking water standards? You know, I, I'm not hearing any any comparison for frame of reference, you know, parts per trillion or parts per billion or whatever. Um, might Casella be importing leachate for profit from other places? Of course, I, I, be, I may have misunderstood part of that conversation, but it sounds like they're at liberty to be bringing in other landfills leachate and passing it through their supply chain, in effect, dumping on Montpelier. Um, what testing has already shown, what, what testing has been done, it's already shown the concentrations that we're dumping in the river and what those impacts are on, on fish and, and wildlife and even swimmers who accidentally inhale a mouthful of water. Um, I, I just think, to, to be to, suggesting that this is impractical is, is really making a, a judgment on the profits of a private corporation, a very large private corporation, a very profitable private corporation. So I don't think we should be pop popularizing the notion that it's impractical to just stop this, you know, stop it. We're not at liberty or to to poison our our wildlife or our our friends and neighbors. Thank you. Are there a, what's that? Okay, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Just an answer to the initial question. Last year, the city was paid four hundred and seventeen thousand dollars by Casella for year. accepting. The last year, the city was paid four hundred and seventeen thousand dollars by the by Casella to accept leachate. Um, great. Uh, yes, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Casey Whiteley. I live in Montpelier. And um, I used to live in the Northeast Kingdom and work in Newport. So I, and years ago, took my trash to uh, the landfill in Coventry before it became Casella. Um, I appreciate that we have gotten ourselves into a very difficult situation. And I feel like we're almost in some ways imprisoned by where we're at today. And um, I think here we are discharging PFAS and other toxic chemicals into our waterways and into, you know, an international lake where people are getting their drinking water out of it. And I think one of the reasons, and I'm, and I know you guys are doing your best to try and to come up with solutions and options for this, but one of the reasons why I think we're in this mess is because ANR, we have no water quality standards for PFAS, and nor do we have any kind of a state plan for how we dispose of our waste. We have rules and standards and uh, regulations for all kinds of public services, telecommunications, electricity, renewable energy development, but not for sort of a basic public need, which is like what happens to our solid waste and how do we manage it? Instead, I think we've given over a lot of responsibility to a private company whose job it is to make money on that waste. And the more they bring in, the more money they make. They're just doing their job. So it's not Casella's fault that our rivers and lakes are being contaminated and poisoned. It's really the state's responsibility for solid waste. To, to do something about this. And it's not just Montpelier's situation. And I feel like we're in a bind right here now, but being forced with choices that are 
really not good choices. Um, I'm sure you guys from ANR all know that your mission is to protect and restore our natural resources and protect our human health. And so I think you need to develop water quality standards and a plan for managing and safely disposing of our waste. I know, um, you know, I, I kind of have a feeling that since Casella was given permission to expand the landfill a couple years ago by I think 50 acres or something like that, of course they're going to bring in more waste and fill that up. And I think we're taking a lot of stuff from New Hampshire and, and we, it, is, it is ending up coming down here to us. There's no doubt about it. So now we're being asked to approve a draft discharge permit for which you guys really haven't developed any regulations or performance standards. And that permit cedes authority and responsibility to Casella for so many decisions in this draft permit. And, they're, and I know you guys say you're gonna monitor their decisions and their choices and what they pick for a site and technologies, but you really have handed over a lot of this process to somebody who's not supposed to be taking responsibility for our environment. So um, I just think it's time for the state and that's you guys are representing the state to step up and take responsibility for what happens to our solid waste and the disposal of this leachate that's full of chemicals. And a lot of the chemicals that you guys are gonna test for, there's lots more in the leachate that aren't even on the list. So um, there's, there's just so many complexities and difficult situations that we're faced with now. And I just think that we need to back up and you guys got to step back and step up and take some responsibility for this. Thank you. Anyone else in person? Yep, come on up. Good evening, good evening, Mayor. We've met before. My name is Jay Walsh, I'm from Newport, Vermont. Um, just to start, uh, I wanted to go over, there was a statement right at the beginning uh, by a uh, gentleman from ANR that the uh, statement was to the fact that it's a full treatment uh, of P uh, PFAS, and that's just not true. Uh, there is no full treatment for PFAS. So, um, and then as he also mentioned, you cannot destroy PFAS uh, or these uh, series of chemicals. This means that what you're going to be dumping into that river is going to remain for generations. It'll be in the, the um, uh, it'll be in the water. It's going to be in the plant. It's going to be in the fish. Um, it's eventually going to get to the wells that are uh, located to private wells along that this river. Uh, in the next 20 years, you're going to see the effects of what's been going on since I guess 1994. Um, in the past 10 years. Um, ANR has dumped over 72 million gallons of leachate through the Montpelier wastewater treatment plant, only partially treated into the Dog River and into the uh, Winooski. This leachate contains upwards of 200 commingled chemicals into a toxic super mix that no one has ever tested. What this complexity of chemicals does to a human being, no one has tested this, at least in the three years of research that, that I've been delving into. And then the, now they're asking Montpelier to take another 72 to 108 million gallons over the next five years. Now note, once this pretreatment facility is built in Coventry, which is the plan, and they, that they'll dump it into the, uh, the, the river up there, you will not see another dime. They, part of the plan of this, and it's right in a and uh, review in, or in discussions uh, with a and is how do we offset the cost? How does Cassell offset the cost of uh, building this facility? Trucking. They're not gonna truck that anywhere. They're gonna put a pipe right into uh, the, the Black River and they're gonna dump tens of millions of gallons a year into there. And one would think that this couldn't get worse. a is also authorizing permitting and the importation of tens of millions of gallons of toxic chemicals and PFAs into Vermont for the sole purpose of disposal into our rivers and lakes for profit. It, it, you, you guys can't be the dumping ground for this. Now, the good people here in Montpelier, they see a responsibility to account for their waste. They're trying to reduce their waste. They're doing what they have to take a portion of the leachate that comes from the landfill here. But 
Both Coventry and Bethlehem landfills take in more than 30% of their waste from out of state, from New Hampshire, from Maine, from Massachusetts, from New York, from Connecticut, which means that nearly three quarters of the leachate that, you, that they want you to accept here is derived from out of state waste. This is pure profit. Wind and Vermont's rivers and lakes become the toxic dumping ground for the profit of privately owned landfills and, and dump their waste, the waste from New England and New York into Vermont. Leachate and the hundreds of chemicals that are contained along there, which is, here's a short list. Highlighted ones are just the ones that are extremely toxic to human beings. Probably about a dozen or so, that's just one of 200. They present a clear and present danger to the health of Vermonters and the Vermont environment. There's already a health advisory for drinking water systems in a dozen Vermont locations for PFAS. And ANR even has in their roadmap that they, they're going to outline monitoring for fish consumption advisories. What, what are we talking about here? What, this isn't pristine Vermont. This is, this is a dumping ground. You know, I'm sorry that you guys are, are being burdened with this. We had to fight in, in Newport. We had to actually go to court because the our city council are cowards. The mayor there is a coward. They turned, when I came to speak to your mayor here, they had just voted to not take it anymore. In the background, while we were gone, they were convinced, no, you should take it. And the, and the, the city manager is all for it because of the money. Okay, you're going to see money for a while. You're going to see a lot of pollution, and then you're going to see zero. You better start budgeting now for that zero day. One of ANR's attorneys claims um, that the importation is protected by the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Okay, this is not correct. Okay, the issue of public health and safety are not protected by the Commerce Clause, as so stated by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court states dormant Commerce Clause recognizes health and safety regulations as primarily and historically a matter of local concern. So there's two things I'm asking uh, of you tonight. Well, one of you and one of uh, A&R. The first is that please do not take any leachate that is brought into the state from out of state. Please do not. And then I'm asking today in this public forum of Secretary Moore to halt the importation of leachate under her obligation to protect Vermont citizens and the environment from threats to human health and safety. That's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in person wish to make a comment? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, all right, but we have a few folks uh, online here. So um, Linda Berger, uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Linda Berger. I'm a resident of District 1. My question is, what is the relationship of Montpelier's um, waste treatment processing and this leachate? Um, currently, I understand that we need to initiate and complete phase two of the waste treatment plant. So what's the relationship of that to the leachate that we're currently accepting? I'm probably ask our experts, um to comment on that the in theory late the phase two has to do with the sludge drying so the initial relationship would have to do uh, I think with the question Councilmember Hurl raised about what we do with the dried product if there was still PFAS in it and obviously um, if we were to not collect the revenue we'd have to look at uh, how the financing of that worked but uh, we're actually having an update on that project in two meetings December 8th so we'll be able to talk about that in more detail then. And uh, just to follow up on that, I have other questions around that same topic, um, including, you know, is there a minimum volume that we need to make even phase one work? And then, you know, if we were to stop taking leachate, what are our options um, for that? So great question. Thank you. Um, all right. And we're going to, I'm going to go sort of down the line that I, uh, see the hands in uh, Deborah Dwyer, and then we'll go to Shana. Uh, hi, I'm Deborah Dwyer. I'm in District One, and um, 
I too was wondering why the permittee Casella, the potential polluter, is being given so much power and responsibility. You know, why why would we give them uh, the responsibility to monitor the level of pollution and to come up with a treatment plan? And also monitoring things two or three or four times a year does not seem sufficient. Um, and I'm pretty shocked that we're taking leachate. This is a new one on me. I'm pretty shocked that we're taking leachate from other states. And uh, um, yeah, I think we have to uh, examine everybody's profit motive here and uh, realize that the protection of our environment trumps all of that. Um, thank you. Thank you. I also just want to um, jump in here. Is there anything that you would um, want to address so far? I mean, there have been a lot of public comments so far. Um, any clarifications? I just want to give you the opportunity if you want. The only thing that I would add is that we, the full time period for this permit is open. It is open till November 24th. Everything that you are saying here, you should say to us through the public comment process so that we can continue to evaluate all that information as we review the permit and make any necessary changes final before issuing the final permit. Um, is there an easy a way to access that yep, comment? We, yeah. we can share all of that information with you. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we're gonna go, uh, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, just, um, I, I'll get more detail on this, but it's our understanding at least, and perhaps um, there's more that we don't know, is that we only accept leachate from Coventry and Moortown. We don't think we're getting out of um, leachate, but unless it's coming through Coventry, um, yeah, you, well, you're allowed under the permit, right? You're authorized. I understand we're allowed to, but we don't, we have not been accepted. Yeah, the last time a, a discharge from the New Hampshire landfill was received at Montpelier was, um, it was a few years ago, and it was, um, I can get the exact numbers for you, but you don't receive leachate from the New Hampshire landfill on a regular basis. Um, there was two months in, I believe it was 2018, that you had received a discharge of that leachate. Um, and you know, you, you're not seeing that on a you're not seeing that on a regular basis. You do receive leachate from the C V landfill, the closed landfill in East Montpelier, probably about twice a month. So on a on a regular basis, which is also included in, in the permit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Shana and then um, Renee. Hi, yeah, my name is Shana Casper. I am on District 2 in Kent Street, Montpelier. I'm also, for the next 48 hours, the Vermont State Director with Community Action Works, formerly Toxics Action Center. have also spoken last week, last uh, City Council meeting and uh, comments at the ANR meeting. Um, but yeah, Community Action Works, you know, we believe that environmental threats are big, but that the power of well-organized community groups is bigger. And that's why we work side by side with folks to fight pollution threats in their neighborhoods. And um, one of the big parts of my job is over the past five years, I've been co-facilitating the National PFAS Contamination Coalition, uh, which is all of these folks across the country have been fight, you know, facing and dealing with significant PFAS contamination in their communities. And that has really led to me being really, really concerned about these chemicals and just seeing the health impacts that these families are facing. And I, um, that this concern has really led me to, to being really concerned with both the permit and with this fact that just Vermont, uh, that Montpelier is, is taking this um, as well. And I really wanna make sure that our community is protected and that we're protecting the drinking water source of folks all you know, across the state and, in, and, and you know, across the region in New York and in Canada as well. Uh, and we need to start a clock in committing of not taking PFAS contaminated leachate um, and in order for us to take the leachate, we need to know that it is PFAS free. And I'm worried that if we continue to take PFAS contaminated leachate, it'll put us in a bind for when we have, when we do come up with these surface water effluent standards for PFAS, because we won't want our wastewater treatment facility to be a point source for PFAS. And this draft permit gives Casella too much authority over the development and you know implementation of this pilot project. And we also want to recognize that it, it's not just on the on this permit and that we can't punt this problem off to another town, you know, if this was rewritten to include another town or, you know, we're in working with Plattsburgh, we need to connect with the Plattsburgh City Council and commit to not 
you know, making sure that across the region we're not committing, to, we're committing to not taking PFAS contaminated leachate. The solutions are complicated, as has been named. We need to go really far upstream, and that's why you know we've been organizing for decades in Vermont to move away from burning and burying our trash and to move towards zero waste. So I were you know working to pass these policies to move upstream and to ban PFAS leachate from you know or ban PFAS from getting into our landfills and becoming leachate by stopping getting it into our products um, that then go into the landfills. We need to be kind of tackling this project at on all sides, and that includes on the back end. Um, you know, here in Montpelier of refusing to, you know, take this PFAS contaminated leachate um, and recognizing that this permit as written is, is, is not um, working on a timeline or on a, uh, on a scale that is, is, gonna, is, is addressing the urgency that this moment requires. Um, so thanks. Thank you. Uh, Renee, and then uh, the bridge. Oh, hi. Good night. Um, I'm right now, I'm also a resident from Montpelier, a neighbor of China. So um, I wanted to, I am not sure why we're having this discussion tonight to allow Cosella to pollute even more waterways with PFAS from the landfill leaching. Cosella and the state should be involved in and looking for the solutions and effectively be cleaning the leachate before bringing it to our municipalities. Our municipalities should be looking at, at leachate and saying, okay, it looks good, we'll process it. Um, as was mentioned by the gentleman from ANR, we had this permits in 1994. How is it possible that Casella and the state haven't yet created a solution because we've known forever that the leachate is contaminated, not just with PFAS, but other chemicals. Um, as Reg and all the waste management expert says, the best way to prevent the distribution of PFAS chemicals is to contain them in the landfill where they can do no harm. When the leachate is transported off site, there is a clear and present risk of the chemicals being released into the environment. Therefore, the leachate should be kept and used at the landfills. By current regulations in most states allow the recirculation of leachate and condensate at line, landfills. Of course, this only delays the inevitable, which is that eventual need to dispose of the leachate due to the amounts increasing over time. Furthermore, the concentration of the beef has increased as the leachate is recirculated. Therefore, this is not really a solution to the problem. Um, there was a study conducted by Patel and the EPA on the challenges of PFAS remediation, but they say that the natural attenuation and long-term monitoring is not an effective strategy of PFAS. So the plan to monitor is not a solution or even a strategy for controlling this. An active treatment strategy must be used to either clean up the contaminants or containers so that it cannot leach from contaminated soil into the groundwater or drinking water. All municipalities in Vermont and neighboring states should say no to polluting our waterways and environment. It isn't a question of the amount we should be allowing or not. There should not be any PFAS or other chemicals in the EHA. There are already studies of possible solutions and also using this leachate for um, creating some type of energy gas that is uh, will be beneficial for Casella. Uh, and uh, we should move towards a solution to stop destroying our environment. Um, the only viable solution again, is to contain the chemicals. So I urge the council to say no and talk with other municipalities to say no to this and to the plan to be to create for Casella and the state's involved to create a state of the art facility that will clean the leachate before it comes to us or any municipality. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, anyone else? I, I see um, on the bridge or uh, Cassandra Hemingway took uh, their hand down. So um, anyone else virtually wish to make a comment? You can also, you can use the raise hand reaction or you can just unmute yourself and, or you can turn your camera on and wave. Uh, any of those are options. Okay. All right, Jack. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not an expert or specialist in any of this stuff. I just, so I, I'm really just learning. And so my questions are, uh, are from that perspective. Um, and so I just have a, a few questions. One is in the uh, in the pilot uh, program that you're uh, requiring a, a news VP to come up with. Um, do you already have a standard for what the level of uh, remediation or what level of removal you're uh, you're going to be requiring uh, them to produce? And is there a way to know if that's the right standard or if that uh, if some other jurisdiction is uh, is holding uh, waste creators to a separate to a potentially higher standard? Thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, so, so the part of the process of uh, that Nick alluded to was the development of a transfer, uh, excuse me, technology-based effluent limit. Essentially, what is the capability of the treatment technology to remove that? We have seen on the drinking water side, where we have much more experience, that that there are treatment technologies that remove it to a non-detect standard. Um, which is as close to zero as the science community gets. Um, the that so we we are hopeful that those that, that treatment will will work, um, but we need to we need to see what it, what it looks like in large scale use. Um, the 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 technology based effluent limit allows us to sort of understand that technology and set limits accordingly. Um, the limits that we have in place to protect Vermonters currently are about drinking water and groundwater, as well as our, where, we, uh, where we manage site cleanups, uh, where there have been PFAS releases into the environment. Those, that is currently at 20 parts per trillion for the five chemicals that were listed. That is, the, to, to my mind, the most stringent standard in the country and has been for uh, the th three years that those five chemicals have been on the list, and we were the first uh, to really look at the, the first two, PFOA and PFOS, in any real meaningful way in terms of setting standards. And so there are, we have numbers about what we think the toxicity data is that we rely on the Vermont Department of Health for, and they've done a really sort of frankly groundbreaking job uh, getting out in front and trying to understand that work and for what limited knowledge we have. And so that will all play into the our understanding. But the development of a surface water standard, which is one of the ways in which we can regulate discharges, involves a lot of study of the implications to, to, the, to the ecosystem and whatnot. And that is work that is happening at the, the federal level. And as I said, every state would need to do this individually if they if we were going to do it state by state. So it makes sense to, for that body of knowledge to, to be developed at the federal level. Um, and so, but those are all factors that can play into this process as our, the state of our knowledge improves over the next few years. Thank you. Um, obviously, we know that these are compounds that are going to be in the landfills for decades to come, if if not more. So as as I'm thinking about the public policy concerns here, um, and people are saying, well, just stop it, just don't take any more here, and uh, and so I'm just 
thinking about the uh, the overall consequences of doing that is it possible to uh, conclude whether the net effect on on the entire ecosystem would be better if we said well we're just not going to take any more uh, period um, and leave it where it is where which presumably is in, in a landfill where it's going to be leaking out into the groundwater anyway i'm i would i'm guessing so is there is there a way to compare a couple of different uh, paths that we might be going on and which has a net uh, more positive value for uh, the environment? I'm not sure it's possible to answer the net positive <laughs> outcome on most things that are net benefit outcome on most of the things we do as a human society, but I, it would, I think you, it would depend on where you were and, and the transport of that PFAS. We don't, frankly, we don't know everything about the way it interacts with the environment. And so we don't know where it's gonna end up. We've seen it in places, we've all over the place. We've seen it in in soils on, you know, the mountaintops of Vermont and the Green Mountain National Forest that have never had any form of development on them, right? This stuff is everywhere. And so it's it's difficult to 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 say that the source that this Mont, the Montpelier wastewater treatment facility as a source how that would net out as in, rather than it going to Plattsburgh and sort of the net sort of overall Champlain Basin ecosystem I I can't answer that question. Oh well. <laughs> Thank you. It's worth Sorry. asking. <laughs> oh, Connor. I, I think sort of related, like would the Department of Health have like an epidemiologist who says, okay, like you got PFAS, you're sort of the known like, you know, negative health impacts of it. And is there any pattern that relates to the vicinity of the discharge points? Or for some reason, is that like an impractical way to look at it? So we've done a number of, so there's been an, a lot of, this is actually the, like nationally where more work has been done in terms of looking at sources of PFAS, exposure to PFAS and what it's meant for health implications. They are not what we consider sort of longitudinal studies that have said, you know, we're monitoring somebody over time who we've had, had, had a known exposure in the national data, but that's improving to some extent again it's it's relatively new in the sort of scientific world obviously it's been in production since the 40s i believe various versions of these chemicals um and so we're we're all a little bit late to the understanding of what what these issues are um in terms of that that's part of the the civil suit that's happening in in bennington is around exposures and what liability St. Gobain as the owner of that facility has in terms of the health impacts of those those people with drinking water wells above what a health based standard is and that's what our how we developed that 20 parts per trillion is looking at the Health impact, the health, the known toxicity data, and Dr. Sarah Vos at the health department is a state toxicologist. It's her role to you know sort of run that reference dose, which is sort of what we know uh, an unhealthy amount to be, and to run through various calculations. And we have, I would say that we have the most stringent uh, sort of set of equations in the country in terms of the conditions that we look at to get to our standards, which is why Vermont across the board has some of the lowest standards in the country for most contaminants. Go ahead. But on that, in Bennington, where you found these high levels in the water, people have been consuming it for a long time mm -hmm. before it was, oh, you can't drink this anymore. Has there been any apparent data looking at that community of health manifest, you know, manifested so there's a lot of there's a lot of work being managed so that's part of and i'll admit that's to this sort of challenge as a as we are we manage cleanups to the point of getting it cleaned up but not to the impact to people's health and 
you know, sort of financial well-being. So there was a lot of interest in us addressing property values and long-term medical monitoring through our settlement with St. Cobain. That's not authority we at the state, we as the Department of Environmental Conservation have. And so that is why that's a separate process that is playing out in the civil courts right now to understand what impacts people have had and frankly to monitor that data going forward so that if somebody if the suit settles let's say but somebody years from now ends up with a condition that is known to be associated with pfas there may be some recourse for them uh in the future but there hasn't been any identification yet and sometimes there are symptoms and then they find the source so it is typically not something that has an acute impact. Okay. It's a more of a long-term exposure okay. impact, and that's why that monitoring over time really matters. Thank you. Other questions? Otherwise, I, I'd like to get to at least a little bit of discussion about what we want to do. Um, and for that, I, Lauren, I saw you might want to raise your hand, but I don't want to pick on you if you don't want to say anything yet. I have I have some thoughts. So last time we talked about well actually first of all I want to thank everybody who showed up to make comments about this. Um, I think it's been really um, valuable and helpful to to hear from everybody on this topic. I also want to thank you all for being here and taking the time to meet with us and um, I appreciate your your willingness to um, to uh in, well actually to encourage people to make these comments as a part of the um public comment period and, and i also want to thank you for extending the period um of, of public comment um which as i understand it goes till on uh, november 22nd 24 4th 24th okay um and you know as much as we as the city can be um posting that uh, you know links or whatever uh, to our our social media, uh, or as part of the weekly report or whatever, I, I think that would be useful um, for folks to have that from our community as accessible as possible. Um, but you know, in thinking about where we go from here, um, one of the things that we had talked about last time was uh, uh, collectively coming up with a letter that we would submit. Um, for a public comment that had some guidelines or principles. And Lauren, I'll be curious for your thoughts on that. Um, and we, I just wanna frame this to say that we don't actually have to make a decision tonight because we do have another meeting before um, the, that deadline. Um, and I certainly still wanna like hear from folks. Um, one of the things that, I, I just wanna put out that there is, um, there were a couple possibilities that we talked about last time and about a third possibility came up um, in the meanwhile that I think is at least worth talking about or considering. Uh, so one possibility is that we just stop. We're done. Um, and to be fair, even stopping might actually take a little bit of time as we figure out like if there's um, other sources of um, uh, what do we call it septage um so other effluent other not effluent other um inputs into our system that might be required um also just considering the the financial impact of just stopping and how are we going to make up that gap it's not hopefully unovercomable unovercomable um but so that was one option another option was uh you know we could set a timeline you know we'll keep taking it for another couple of years or, or whatever the timeline is, one year, three years, I don't know, um, and put conditions on that for our purposes. Um, and But it, those are the two things I think we sort of talked about last time. And the, the third possibility came up, um, which was that we could stop taking leachate unless these uh, conditions are met, or un we would start taking it again after certain conditions were met. And um, I think that is also worth um, worth talking about. Um, and I, I am also coming back to your question, Jack, about, um, you know, what is the net? It's, it's hard, it's impossible, as you say, it's impossible to know. I mean, one possibility is that if we stop, because we're at 
the cutting edge in a sense of all of this work, does that mean that research and development slows down? I would like to believe that the answer would be no, because the, the EPA is also on this and hopefully as you're, you know, as you were saying is accelerating their work on PFAS. Um, I've spoken enough. <laughs> I'm, I, I've, I'd like to hear from you all, what do you think? And, and in part, this could be um, thoughts on what direction we may want to go as a council in putting together a letter um, to submit as comments or actions that we could take. Yeah. Um, this is a really hard one for me uh, because I'm an indigenous woman and I'm a water protector and I'm a parent. And so trying to think of what's best to do in a situation that feels impossible right now um, is a hard one. Um, so I don't know exactly where I stand. I don't want to push this off into another neighborhood because that always happens. Um, obviously, um, I don't want it to keep coming here because it's affecting our children and, and it's going to affect people for generations to come. Um, this feels very hard and I wouldn't want your job. <laughs> um, and I appreciate the fact that you are both sitting here listening to a lot of public comment that, you know, might feel hard to hear. So I appreciate you sitting here and listening. Um, but as far as where I stand right now, I just, you know, this is a very hard thing to, to discuss and talk about. And I feel comfortable continuing these conversations because I don't want to make a decision on a whim yeah. or under pressure. <laughs> but we're always under pressure, aren't we? Yeah. Fair. Thank you. Other thoughts? Go ahead. I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think we heard it reflected from the agency and from public comments. I mean, as one of the people said, it does feel like we're in a box with no good options. And um, I mean, I guess where I'm still coming down similar to what we talked about last time. I mean, I don't like the idea of us just putting this off onto another community if there is opportunity to end up with a better solution for our region. And this is where us continuing to take it for some finite period of time, if that's gonna keep the pretreatment permit on track. Like it concerns me to hear that that could halt if we don't continue as a permittee. Um, so, you know, to, to Jack's question of big picture, what, you know, what path could lead to a better long-term outcome um you know i mean i i hate to be importing this into our community but um for any period of time so i mean i i still you know similar to the kind of principles we had talked about last time i think we should have a plan to eliminate the intake of the pfas contaminated leachate um i mean i liked Jay's idea and what you had mentioned, um, Anne, about putting a date on it. I mean, I think that, you know, saying something like, as of December 1st, 2022, our water resource recovery facility will no longer accept leachate that contains any detectable PFAS. I think at that point, I mean, a year, it sounds like maybe they could have built it. And so maybe we could accept the treated um, water. I think we could revisit if they've gotten behind, but we feel like there's a good faith effort happening. It could get revisited and, you know, maybe we'd be willing to extend it, but that would just keep some pressure on. I don't know if that's the right exact uh, proposal, but I, I think something showing that we're not just going to take it forever, that this really pretreatment needs to happen. It needs to stay on track. It needs to be timely. It needs to be effective. Um, I'd like to keep that pressure on. And I think 
our role in a permit could push that. Um, so I want to, I want, I don't know, I'd love people's thoughts on that. I mean, I still think we, we as a city can put in comments on some of the, you know, making sure, you know, I, I still do think that A&R's role in, you know, if we're gonna sit, stay at the table in driving the process more, you know, I'd rather have A&R in the driver's seat working with Casella to shape it in a way that is gonna be feasible for them instead of them just helping, um, you know, it felt like Casella's in the driver's seat with them guiding, can we flip that dynamic a little? Um, so I think there should be more oversight of the agency. Um, and I think, you know, increase, increased monitoring and some of the other things we had talked about. So I, I think those same principles, I, if we're gonna stay at the table, putting in that kind of suite. And then I am interested in, I mean, it sounds like we're not really doing it much anyway, but if we can not accept out of state leachate, and you know, maybe our lawyers would tell us we can't <laughs> do that, but um, if, if, if we can, I would like to do that as well. Thoughts? Yeah, Jay. Sure. Um, I'll just add that uh, I'll echo that. I appreciate Peter and Nick being here and acknowledging the, the challenge of this issue. It is it is certainly uh, complex and complicated. There's no doubt about it. Um, I also pre appreciate other counselors' comments about you know um, you know Jennifer and Lauren, like what, Jack. What do we you know what's our what's our place here and what role can we have in this? I think that. The more I think about it, um, you know, the more I realize it. Th this is not a this is not a problem. As much as we are desperate for a solution, this is not a problem that we, as a council, are going to solve, right? Um, but we can play a role in how the state manages, you know, these th this issue. And so I I fully support Lauren's. And, and, we talked about this and, and you alluded to it, Lauren, the, the idea that we put a, a time frame on um, how much longer we're willing to accept the leachate that, you know, that contains PFAS. Um, I think ultimately our responsibility is to our community and to, and to the Dog River and the Nooski River and everybody that's downstream from it. And we, that's where our responsibility lies. So, um, maybe there's a conversation to be had about what that date looks like if it's december 1 2022 you know if it's if it's a year from now then 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 i'd support that if if we thought that maybe it was something we maybe needed to look longer term then then i'm okay with that but i i do feel like we need to um take a take a stand in defense of of the water in our city um and know that um, the, the impact that that what you know what's what we're putting into the into rivers now the impact that it has um, on our community and the communities downstream from us so um, yeah that's my two cents thanks yeah, um, I, I too I, I like the idea of setting some limits I have a question about you can set limits but then you have to have a standard so if we say in 12 months we want such and such we need a standard that's clear what our goals are and what we want from their behavior and we could do it as such to say we have intentions of even maybe a long-term relationship if indeed there's this constant improvement of how it's treated and we become that really solid pallet project in concert with a and r and casella uh, but that we we have to be clear and i don't have the science to lay that out in a motion uh, but I think we, we need to figure that out somehow. What is our standard to go beyond that year? I just wanted to thank you for mentioning the uh, other possibilities um, with putting a timeline on um, how long we would accept it. But also I really appreciated the fact that you mentioned switching the roles and putting Casella behind what our environmental folks um, are doing and not having them be in the driver's seat. Um, I feel like I feel I can sit more comfortably with that. Um, I have a really hard time with big companies like that being in charge of our waterways because I don't think they have historically cared so much about our water and care more about money. So um, I appreciate that. And I also wanted to thank the people that made comment um, in person and um, online. It's 
not easy to have these conversations and I appreciate all the emails that I've been getting and I'm sorry that I haven't been able to get back to everybody but you're here and you're using your voice and I think that's fantastic and another reason why I love Montpelier so that's all I'm done. Good. I agree with everything uh, Lauren said. I do think we can come up with uh, with language, not tonight, because sitting here with, with many people around a table writing something generally is a disaster. Uh, <laughs> but but I think I'm I'm hearing enough uh, <clears throat> support for that idea that I think it's uh, it makes sense to. I think the volunteers were Lauren and Jay and. Just, just the two of you left. <laughs> um, that's fine. Thank, thanks and, for volunteering. And, and I think that that's uh, well. That's I think that's a good way to go. My my thinking is that it's it's hard to picture that one year is enough time if you think permit is issued. They have four months to come up with a plan, and then they start working on it. There won't be much information available by a, a year from now, and then and two years might be a better number. I don't know what you all think about that, but but then my thinking was we would come back and have language to to say yes, next, uh, yes or no next time. Something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Connor then Donna. Yep. Uh, no, that that all sounds good. Um, and I, th I think it's two conversations, right? One is responding to the public comment period, and the principles that Lauren drafted out there seem still seem very relevant, you know. Uh, and I think maybe we've added some stuff tonight that we could incorporate into the comments there. Uh, the longer term discussion, you know, I, I I think we do have a bit of time to suss that out. You know, we don't have a contract with Casella. We could say any time, like you know, banks closed. We're not taking any more, right? So, so we can set a timeline. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It's like the thing that feels good to do would be that say we're not taking it anymore. But I, I think as we hear more information, like what feels good might not be the right thing as far as environmental stewardship, but we're just dumping it back into Lake Champlain and passing the buck to somebody else. So I think it does deserve a bit more conversation around this to see what actually is the best decision for our community and actually for the state of Vermont, because I think we've got that on our shoulders now um, as well here. It's not just a community discussion. It's a discussion of the entire state. Um, so we, we can't take that lightly. But for now, uh, really hats off to Lauren for drafting all this and really appreciate the, uh, the, the guys coming in today to, to, to go over this. Definitely learned a lot. Donna, go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks for being here. And Lauren, uh, maybe perhaps in the discussion of the wording, you can also talk to you know, uh, Nick and Peter and our own solid waste and staff and see what they think on timeline. I mean, is it 18 months? Is it two years? And, and come back and tell us what you found out. That would be very helpful. Can I yeah, interject quickly, Madam Mayor? Um, I would say from a process standpoint, it's if you are going to ask our perspective on an, a separate agreement that you have with Casella, I think that we could contribute to that conversation in, a, in, in some way. I would need to think about that some more. But in terms of developing principles of which you would want to comment on our permit, I think we need to stay arm's length from that. And I hope that's OK. And we're not intending to be. But I think uh, Connor had it right when he said there are sort of two steps to this process we want to know what issues you see specifically with the permit before the 24th that you would like us to address that is the as i like to say the alligator closest to the canoe um and 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 you can continue the conversation about your time frames and other things that we can engage with you Yeah, I, I agree. Having separating those conversations, I think, does make sense. Um, and so at least for next time, we yeah, having a draft um, for 
for that we could all vote on to uh, submit as a part of public comment, I think would be useful. Um, I still have unanswered questions about our facility, you know, like, I, mean, I guess even more in depth than like, oh, we take, you know, we, we made, you know, $400,000 on leachate last year. If we stop taking it, what does that do to our debt service? Um, you know, there's, there's some other things that I think are, um, I just want to have answers to <laughs> before we're, before we either pull the plug or don't. Um, and we'll, we'll have other opportunities to talk about that. So I don't feel done with that second part of the conversation about what, what our plan is or where, what we're going to do. Um, but I think we, we will have those, some other opportunities coming up even to, to talk more about it. Um, and I look forward to that. Yes. I just had two quick questions while we have our ANR experts with us. Just one on timeline. What's the like earliest if everything went exactly right that the pilot pretreatment could be up and running in your like best guess? Earliest, well, so the permit requires it to be up and running a year after the issuance of the permit. Obviously, the longer it takes us to respond to comment and finalize that permit, the longer out that timeline gets. So it's impossible for me to answer that question because we're, we're not done with the public comment period yet. So once we see issuance of the permit though, we'd anticipate a year after that. And then is there one, just one other, um, is just thinking of our own facility and even you referenced earlier that even if we stop taking the leachate, there's other PFAS sources, obviously the leachate is a, you know, a concentrated source. Do you know right now, I know there's been a lot of money for like um, PFAS contamination pieces and some of the federal infrastructure and stuff. Like, are there potential opportunities of better filtration for our own water resource recovery facility that might be coming up that we might wanna be looking into? So we're just getting a sense of what's in the recently passed and signed into law and bipartisan infrastructure framework, whatever it's, whatever its current manifestation is, has something like $8 million a year for the next five years, I think, for Vermont for emerging contaminant related drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. I'm not exactly sure how that will roll out. Um, typically that runs through our normal state revolving fund loan programs and we can, I think, but I think it's all I think it's 100% cost share. I don't know if you've looked into this yet, Nick. I, I mean, it's as of last Friday, so my knowledge isn't quite there yet, but I can share what we know at this point, but there are going to be resources specifically from the federal government, specifically for PFAS-like uh, contamination options. They, I, I, $40 million sounds like a lot of money over five years. I think it's going to wind up being a drop in the bucket towards the overall need, which is again why the litigation exists. I'll just put in a pitch for your friendly local <laughs> off taker of all the leachate in the state right now. <laughs> uh, there is one funding program that currently exists. Um, it's the American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA program. That um, there's a pretreatment initiative um, as part of that program, and the state is. Um, we're, we're looking to fund um, pretreatment projects, which include municipal projects, which would be like planning projects. And those, those would include like the identification and of um, sources of pollutants coming into their wastewater treatment facility. Um, we're also looking to fund pretreatment projects at private businesses, which a pretreatment project for the reduction of PFAS would be eligible under that. Um, so that that's a funding program that we've just announced through through our um, you know through the recent um, American Rescue Plan Act um, initiative, and um, we're we're still in the process of developing like the prioritization criteria and the ultimate um, the the final um, rules for that for that program. But currently, we have an RFI a request for information out. And we're seeking input from municipalities and private businesses on what what are the what are your pretreatment issues, what are your pretreatment needs, and our goal is to tailor a funding program to to meet those needs. So 
that that is an opportunity and, and I'd encourage you to um, submit a response on the RFI that's currently live and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to share the, the link for that. That closes next Friday. Um, so that's an interesting opportunity. Right now there's $2 million available through that fund with um, the hope to extend it to um, 10, 10 million. Um, and um, it does require a partnership between the municipality and the private entity, which, which could be challenging, um, but, but that's, that's um, you know, a potential opportunity. Any other final comments here, team? Kind of part of process. Um, oh, so we're uh, not taking any other public no, comment it's not at the moment. It's a process. Could you, because of the folks that came and spoke tonight, direct staff to take the transcript from the YouTube and file it in that process before the 24th? That's uh, out of respect for all the folks that made the effort to articulate their concerns on this permit. Um, I'm going to let folks make that, uh, make those comments on their own. Um, and I'm, I appreciate that. Uh, you all have heard, have heard it, um, but uh, yes. You, uh, to that point, uh, Commissioner Watt did say he was going to tell us how people could post comments. Yeah. We, we'll post it ourselves, but you may want to mention it publicly yeah. tonight. Yeah, sure. Um, so you can post public comments a few different ways. We're accepting comments via email. Um, you can read the email address off for folks. Um, we're also accepting comments on our environmental notice bulletin, which is the um, the department's platform for public noticing permits and applications and, and accepting public comments. Um, we're also taking comments by mail. So um, the email is anr.wsmdwastewater at vermont.gov. Um, and like I said, there's also the ENB website. Want to, want to say that one again? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Do, would it help if I gave you, are you going to be posting this in your minutes? Yeah, but just for the folks who are listening, that might be, like me try to write it down quickly. Yep. So the, the email address is anr.wsmdwastewater. Anr.wsmdwastewater at vermont.gov is is the email address that we that we're accepting public comments that the period is open until um, close of business on November 24th. We're also accepting written comments. Um, the address is the Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Environmental Conservation, Watershed Management Division, One National Life Drive, Davis Three. Montpelier, Vermont, 05620. Um, and like I said, the, the environmental notice bulletin is, is also there to accept where you can post comments. Um, and it's also on the wastewater programs website. There's um, a, a link with the draft permit and um, a, a portal to submit comments. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to point out, Stephen, that was not a point of order, and it, is, it was a public comment, so please uh, be respectful of other people's, um, uh, of our time. If we're going to have public comment, we'll have public comment, um, and if you're going to raise a point of order, it needs to be that, not a request of counsel um, to have a motion. That's not appropriate. Um, okay. It is 8.30. Now. Oh, it's 8.40. Uh, we are going to take a break. <laughs> and uh, so we will be back at 8.50. All right. Okay. All right. So it is 8.52. We are coming back from our break. Uh, all right. And we are moving into the, the winter parking. Uh, I guess it's really an, sort of an update. Um, and uh, so, I, 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 Bill, did you have anything you wanted to say? Before I turn it over to uh, uh, no, DPW just folks. Briefly, while the DPW folks are getting set up, um, just a reminder to people that last year we en enacted a new winter parking uh, system during the winter months, uh, the alternate side parking that will be in effect again this year. And DPW's goal today is to review that policy for as a reminder and maybe go through a couple of minor changes and take some questions. But really, this is as much informational as anything else. So I'll turn it right over to them. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Zach Blodgett. For those of you who, do, who don't know me, um, Cameron, can you allow me to share the screen by any chance? 
He's on it. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so as Bill just mentioned, we're here to talk about uh, winter operations, uh, specifically the alternate side parking program uh, that we will be uh, starting, which is effective uh, Monday of next week, November 15th. Um, just to review from last year, there were, we had a, a list of pros and cons in our, in our first year of the, the trial. Um, the mainly uh, the cons were we had uh, we had to have an, an employee exclusively deal with ticketing. Um, this was a, a heavier lift for our police department uh, with the changes because there were more streets that they were enforcing uh, on a on a nightly basis. Uh, we had twice the amount of tickets that were issued um, last year in comparison to some other years. There was a couple streets that had a high level of non-compliance, uh, and then we noticed that it wasn't a perfect fit for every street. Um, some of the pros that we experienced last year was the, that we had the autonomy to perform work as needed. Uh, there were virtually no emergency access issues. Um, we had very few cars towed at the end of the year, um, which was different than the, the previous years when we had a, a winter ban that was in effect. We had uh, way less uh, complaints um, from years past. We felt like we provided a better level of service to the citizens and residents of Montpelier. We had uh, the costs uh, for DPW to perform winter ops were, were better managed and we had very little manual posting to do. Uh, so in preparation for this year, we've, we sent out flyers with the water bills to remind people of the changes um, we've posted um, the word on Front Porch Forum and Facebook and other media sources. Uh, we spent time working with the bridge to do an article uh, to also help get the, the word out uh, via the newspaper. Um, there was an issue specifically uh, related around Elm Street um, between um, by the doctor's office uh, at Elm and Spring Street intersection. Uh, so we just made a change there slightly to allow um, no overnight parking 1 a.m. to 7 a.m., uh, which will allow us to cle clear that section, but um, will then allow daytime parking. Um, we have um, just secure, you guys just approved tonight on the consent agenda, uh, the parking lot plowing contract. Um, and then the other thing that uh, we just recently did is we sat down with Crosstown Towing and we kind of developed a, a plan forward for how to deal with uh, the towing. Um, there was some concern because we only towed three total cars last year um, about them continuing to provide that service for the city of Montpelier. Um, they were uh, not necessarily interested in that little amount of towing, um, but we worked it out and um, we have a plan forward for this year. Um, some other issues that uh, have come up is mainly um, we still are working to fill a couple vacant positions. Um, we've made some good progress on that. Um, and then really the other big issue um, is which it's um, we're trying to get the, the word out to the public and we included in the flyer is for people to not place their trash receptacles in the middle of the sidewalk. Um, that makes it very hard for our sidewalk plow operators because they have to get out, move the trash can, and then move it back um, after they get by. Um, so we, this year in the flyer, we try to develop a, um, just a, a simple placement, preferred placement location so that people understood well, where we would like them to place their, their trash can that was out of the way for us to do our snow removal. Um, so with that, uh, we're about to uh, enter into uh, the alternate side parking program on Monday, and I will open it up for any discussions that you all may have. Great. Any questions for Zach? Comments? Okay. I, I was um, glad to see that uh, there, it sounds, one of the questions I had coming into this was what was the plan uh, for Elm Street in that problematic area? And it sounds like um, 
that's been addressed, that's great. I was also really glad to see that there were fewer um, total towings that happened uh, as a result of this plan. That um, that was pretty encouraging to me uh, for this. Uh, any other thoughts or comments? Chris? Yeah, go I, ahead, Donna. I just, just want to thank you for the, the data you presented. That was very helpful. That's why we don't have questions. You answered them all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally true. Uh, public comment. Oh, no, Jay, go ahead. Um, Zach, I'm curious if you all have a plan. Um, my sense is that uh, if we, if if you have a plan to sort of ease into the enforcement of this, um, my my fear is that you know we've had a fair amount of warm days, including today. Um, I know the street signs are up, and and that's great to to remind people. But and I know you've done some outreach, but. Honestly, I, I haven't seen too much of it online, so I don't know how extensive it's been, like Front Porch Forum and social media. Um, I'd hate to be in a place where we just start ticketing on Monday and people are like, it's 50 degrees out, what's going on? Um, so I, I know like we did last year where we put, um, uh, you know, sort of faux tickets on cars. They, were, they look like tickets, but they're just like, hey, this is a warning, keep in mind. Um, that this is coming and I, I don't know that there's any snow in the forecast but I do feel like if we're too heavy-handed early on this still is just the second year of this program so I think that we need to really be sort of um, cognizant of that and gentle how we enforce it in the next few weeks thanks that's, that's part of the reason for this meeting and we are going to be doing as much outreach as we can and snow is predicted for Monday so that's <laughs> good planning on DPW's <laughs> part to get awareness there Okay, any public comment on this? Okay, and anybody online wish to comment on this? Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much, Zach. And yeah, yeah thanks for your uh, presentation, full of good information. All right, thank you. Have a good one. Yep. Okay. All right, so we are ready to move on to uh, follow up to the police review. Uh, committee's recommendations. And uh, so we have a set, actually, I just want to put a little frame around this if I can. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about a set of the recommendations, not the whole set, uh, but particularly around the ones where there is um, uh, some agreement, not just some agreement, there's agreement between uh, the, the department and the police review uh, committee, their, uh, with their recommendations. So uh, actually, maybe I can list out those things. So uh, prioritizing the purchase and implementation of body worn cameras, establishing a community engagement protocol after use of force incidents, the demilitarization of equipment purchases, training for engagement with youth crowd control and scenario based training as they are available and supporting street outreach expansion through many means, including homelessness task force funding resources. Um, and uh, I just want to be clear that there were other recommendations that came out of that um, report. And I uh, just want to make sure everyone's clear that we're probably not really going to be talking about those other things uh, this evening. Um, we may talk about when we want to schedule uh, talking about those things, but um, that is probably it for now. So um, hoping that we can just stay on topic because those other things have a lot of gravity and um, there could be a lot of conversation about those other things, and we want to give them their, um, you know, their their due uh, conversation. But this is about um, just this limited set. And of just to uh, to set expectations in advance for for the public and for the council, I think from our perspective, for staff and, and maybe the committee is, we're looking. We're not looking for you to finally approve anything tonight, but we are looking to see to get a signal from the council whether you also agree with these recommendations. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we're gonna go out and buy these things. We still have to do a budget. So, but it does tell us, gee, we should consider these as budget time and, and bring them to your attention and figure out the impact as opposed to, you know, heck no, we don't want this. So we don't have to do any more work on it. So you're not making final decisions, but if there's something you really object to, this is kind of your chance to let us know. Otherwise, we'll just keep proceeding, trying to implement things. Um, and obviously, we'll have more in-depth conversations. 
No, that, that was a lot of preface, but thank you. <laughs> and I'll, I'll turn it over to you all. <laughs> okay. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, uh, Clerk Odom, uh, City Manager Frazier, and Assistant City Manager uh, Nina Meyer. Uh, members of the public, my name is Brian Pete. I'm the Chief of Police for the Montpelier Police Department and extraordinarily proud to be here and very thankful. Um, what I wanted to do uh, is to provide the council with information regard related to the um, our, our position or how we were looking at with the Police Review Committee. Um, so rather than fighting with the system to look for the PowerPoint presentation, I'll just go from slide to slide. Uh, with me is Dan Tao. He is uh, part of the Police Review Committee. Uh, Dan's a huge advocate for mental health, um, a huge advocate for peer. Uh, he and I see a lot uh, alike uh, in regards to like crisis intervention training and response. And also on this call is Alex Popoff, who is the founder of Visual Labs, who is our would who would, is my preferred vendor for body worn camera system. And Alex is just, he's got, there's five slides here, just to give a general overview and to give some information regarding body worn cameras and how that system works. Oh. I broke it somehow. It. <laughs> I'm a cop, I'm not. <laughs> And you look great. <laughs> I did break it, huh? Let's see if this works. Oh, well, I can use the arrow button. Um, all right, so these are the topics that uh, I'd like to touch on. Um, just to, to uh, just a, again, uh, a brief review of what the mayor had provided, just in a visual form of what those recommendations were to identify the consensus recommendations that we've had with little or no substantial cost impact, and then to identify some of those recommendations that would have a substantial cost impact to the budgeting process, just so the council's aware of what these what these may or may not look like. And then, uh, then to provide an overview of what the remaining items are that would be discussed. So before I get into it, I do want to say that our goal, and we will be, and I believe we are, the best public safety is to provide the best public safety for our community, uh, services for our community. We also plan to be the best police agency in the state and nationally recognized leader in law enforcement. And, and that's what drives us, is, is providing an amount of, the best amount of service to those we're sworn to protect and to help. And that help and service comes in all kinds of forms. And we're very, which leads me into the next part, is very grateful for the opportunity with the PRC. So we wanna publicly thank the PRC. That was a lot of work and in the time of a lot of strife, a lot of anger and emotion. We had people who came out from our community and donated their time, time away from home, work from their families, and we recognize that. I'm not, on, I'm not kissing up because it was not a pleasant experience. Because <laughs> when you have to look at yourself, you have to take an honest assessment of yourself, and that's never easy. Um, but we had people who came out and, and who were, and, and the intent of the PRC was, was critical but it was also looking at a way that how they can help the department be better and how we can provide the best possible service to, to our community. So again, I really wanna thank the PRC. So one of the, one of the slides that came out uh, that they had presented last time, they talked about some of the things that, we've, that we agreed with and some things that we don't have necessarily consensus with. So I've highlighted these here in, in red of what I'm going to touch on today in summarizations. Did I just break the buttons too, camera? I just, I don't smash that hard because I'm not that strong anymore. I'm too old. Uh, now the cursor's working. All right. Okay, <laughs> so um, the, first, the first topic that I'd like to uh, just briefly touch on is just the community engagement protocol after use of force incidences. So we would just need guidance. And again, like tonight is not for that. It's just something for the council to kind of keep in the back of your pockets of what kind of guidance um, for the city regarding our role and the development of any community meetings or outreach processes or protocols if, you know, and God forbid that we have to have use of force incidences that revolve, that involve serious bodily injuries going forward or OISs, which are officer involved shootings. Uh, so in addition to uh, myself, uh, Deputy Chief Nordenson, who is also here, 
um, we're working to assign our new community, actually it should be community relations officer, that's my bad, um, our new CRO is a dedicated public information officer or PIO. Um, and then also to identify a dispatcher to also serve in that role. And the reason for that is we want to provide maximum information with minimal delay to the public as to what's going on. We don't want the narrative to get out of control. We want to provide the facts of what's going on and then move forward from there. So any processes that have to go that, that have to be done are done correctly. Um, just to also let folks know that the state use of force policy highlights that there are new procedures regarding OISs or which again our officer involved shootings for or um, serious bodily harm investigations. And those new procedures reduce uh, the city and the police department's involvement in the investigative process. So it will go to nine times out of 10, the Vermont State Police and the Vermont State Police will control all of the information such as uh, any video footage, uh, records, everything goes to the Vermont State Police. We would do an administrative investigation to look at our policies and procedures while the VSP will conduct a criminal investigation into the incident. And then while they're controlling that incident, they have control of the records, they have control of all the materials. So any release of video footage or anything is preferred to be approved by them before it goes out. Mouse still works. So demilitarization or what's commonly referred to or known as the 1033 program. The Montpelier Police Department has not been involved in the 1033 program for quite some time. We can easily develop a notification and approval process through the city, through, uh, through Bill and Cameron's office, and with the council if need be, but we would primarily prefer that if we do continue to go through or dip back into the 1033 program, that the council gives us direction as to which items that they would rather us concentrate on getting and which they won't, and which ones they won't. Uh, so as a note, there is a lot of regulation and accountability built into the 1033 program. It, they have an annual inventory process, program compliance reviews, and a state coordinated reviews, and it goes through one representative from the state. So any requests go through one person that goes funneled up to, to the federal government to see which items that we can get. Most agencies look for non-controlled items such as office equipment, vehicles, and body armor. One example to give you is that uh, it's a very cost-effective way of what the PRC has pointed out. Um, and again, they, they've looked at it from, from every, every other angle um, that when we're on a tight budget, we can look for these types of things. But the state also has a program that we can get office equipment from as well. So w why not just use that resource rather than pushing through the logistics of this program? But just to give you another idea, so like the incidents that happened on January 17th or the 20th, the body worn or the, the level four body armor that officers had while they were outside at the uh, at the Capitol is expired. Helmets and the level four body armor to stop rifle plates it's expired. Um, so so th that's like an example of something that we can get if it's available through the 1033 program that we can use that's going to be cost effective for us because my estimates are it's going to run roughly thirty five thousand dollars to to uh, uh, get it, get this equipment for um, all the officers within our department. More information on the body worn can or the 1033 program can be found at that below website. So street outreach and training. Uh, so uh, it's 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 when we're looking at, at, at outreach and when we're dealing with folks who have uh, signs of consumption, police officers are trained to look for signs of impairment. Uh, an example of that would be DUI stops. So officers do have this training, they do have this recognition, but we're not medical experts. Um, so as we're looking for um, training or any training that will help us to determine intoxication, we can easily work with EMS, Washington County, uh, the hospital, and, and just so, so anything that we're not already trained in or we're not aware of, we can easily develop a program to do that in house at no cost to the city or at no um, effect to our training budget. Uh, as of note, to put folks at ease, this is something that we've always done was to call for EMS, to call for Bob Gallon's folks to come help us if we see somebody who is going through, uh, who is symptomatic of life threatening symptoms. They're unable to, 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 to again, like walk, 
uh, there's signs of alcohol poisoning. Uh, you know, I, I think that anyone who may have had the opportunity to go to college probably has a very good training background on some of the things uh, to see with intoxication, and that's unfortunate. Um, so MPD, we're not, I am not aware of any specific training that talks about de-escalation or things to, 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 to use with somebody who may have consumed an intoxicant. Um, I, I think that all points of de-escalation revolve around the same thing, time and effective communication that's not like of a judgmental type of a, uh, uh, of a process. Everything has to come from a spirit of how can I help, <laughs> not more or less that this is an annoyance to me. And that's something that our department has to make sure that we're always on guard for. Training youth and adolescent behavior. So the academy does provide some level of information to officers in level two and level three training that I recall in some of the certification courses that I've been through. It's a touch and go training. It's not anything that's necessarily in depth, but I will say that the Montpelier Police Department is working with statewide stakeholders to implement a crisis intervention training program or team program here in Washington County. And this includes Laurie Emerson uh, with NAMI, Dan, um, psychiatric survivors, uh, uh, who else? Just a whole host of people who are, who are very good at this. And, and the whole thing is, uh, is geared towards a, a community response, not decisions based in a law enforcement response. So with the CIT program that brings training, and part of that training in that curriculum talks about uh, the adolescent brain. It talks about the development of the adolescent brain and the development of brains and, 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 and how they affect behavioral disorders and everything else to that effect. So that's coming. Uh, so there's not going to necessarily be a, 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 a cost associated with this, um, but we also would recommend sending uh, uh, Corporal Philbrick, who is our community relations officer, to NASRO, which is the National Association of School Resource Officers, they have already long developed a benchmark plan regarding how to deal with youth and, and the adolescent brain and development and personalities that relate to it. So we could send Mike up there. He can get the specific training for NASPRO for the school resource officer. And then they have a, another class that's especially devoted to adolescence and development. And Mike can take those, those classes, roughly three grand. He can come back, develop a curriculum for us to use in-house and that would be something that we would constantly train ourselves on so that we're not looking at this. These are costs that I'm anticipating we can pull out of our own budget. So training and crowd control. We already prescribe to the Madison model. For those who may not be aware, the Madison model is just, is something that in a nutshell that places emphasis on police resources to incidents that, that involve safety and life. That's the primary. Secondary is property. And then third level is any level of, or any type of amount of civil disobedience. So the primary focus is always going to be life and how to protect life, how to preserve life, anyone who may be injured in certain, certain types of situations and how to make sure that we're not part of an, an escalation process as we're working to control a situation of civil disobedience that may have gotten out of hand. Of course, this is obvious. We are the state capital. We have a critical infrastructure. So this is something that's extraordinarily important for us to do. Um, depending, and, and again, uh, the council is much uh, is already aware of this. We do have challenges depending on the, the size of any crowds that we may be dealing with because of the amount of officers that we would normally have on any given shift. If it's a situation or something that, has, that we're not aware of, that we're not prepared for, if it's an impromptu thing that we had no knowledge of, it's going to take some time to bring those resources together. And those resources require, um, again, our work with our partners, federal, state, and, and the regional law enforcement agencies in Washington County. Um, we have already identified that this is a lack of, of uh, this is a lack of training that we do need. Um, we would recommend that this is something that we bring in somebody to give us hands-on control because this is extraordinarily important stuff that can't be learned virtually. On the, when I, did, when I made these slides and looking at the resources to bring somebody in, the worst, uh, I guess uh, the bad estimate, the highest estimate would be roughly 15K. Our current training budget is 14.8. Um, but uh, uh, Deputy Chief Nordenson had given me some ideas. We've looked at some other options. We think that we could find um, experts, subject matter experts in other places that are, that are, that are subscribed to the Madison model. 
and bring them here for costs that would be less than that uh, and something that we can already in absorb in our current training budget. So scenario-based training. Uh, we, and I apologize for the font on this one. I tried to keep the, the slides at a minimum. We've already received, when I first got here, there are, there are a lot of resources within our community of folks who are doing a lot of things and that we can take advantage of that. We have a lot of organizations, a lot of allies that can give us free training. Uh, Prevent Child Abuse Vermont, the FBI, the Rainbow Co uh, um, Umbrella of Central Vermont, Circle, CVMC. There are a lot of organizations that have come out of the woodwork to say, whatever you guys need, there's some training that we think that you should have, we can provide it to you for free. So we can get those types of specialized training at little to no cost. We do advocate, as the PRC had recommended, scenario-based training um, to augment the Rule 13. Those are training requirements by the state that officers have to have certain levels or certain topics to be trained in annually to maintain certification. And, and scenario-based training is the best. Um, of course, actors and role plays, there's limited opportunities. Um, there are costs associated, associated with it. There's liability concerns. If, if there's a hands-on scenario and somebody hurts a wrist, there, there are liability issues there. So we're looking for um, virtual reality training. And to let the, the council know, we did apply for and won a grant that we have a virtual uh, VR training machine that should be here by the end of the year. And we're also working on grant funding to try to procure more of these machines so that we can have not just one officer going through these things, but several officers. And when we're looking at things like CIT-based training, you've got two officers, and one it's one VR machine, two officers appear, two officers, an outreach worker, going into a situation, virtual reality, and training on that. This also is a cost savings multiplier for us, as well as a ver environmental um, uh, stewardship, because we can actually do things like shoot virtual re reality without wasting the money or without like the lead contamination. So we do have to qualify um, in, in you know, live fire within state requirements, but again, this is another force multiplier in keeping with the council's spirit of environmental stewardship. So what I do wanna say that, uh, I and again, I, I, I don't mean to bring up a, a controversial topic, but Training should not be our only focus as we look at these types of things. MPD needs tools. If we're going to rightfully um, look at the preservation, the sanctity of human life. And in my opinion, the, poli or the PRC's research has shown that the Montpelier Police Department is worthy of the trust that's been bestowed upon officers regarding the current tools of use of force that they have to include firearms. So we, we need to look at the possibility of having other use of force options. And I look at this, uh, again, of course, using the minimum amount of force necessary. And what pushes me on that is uh, that Canton v. Ohio, uh, that lawsuit talks about the liability that officers, that municipalities can, if they can force, summarizing it, if we can foreseeably see that this is something our staff needs to be trained in, we can be liable if we don't train our folks in it or we don't provide our folks the tools they need to find themselves out of cert si certain situations. And then to also let folks know that there was another uh, case that just came out within the Supreme, well within, I'm sorry, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, um, which, which th their jurisdiction, their area is Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. And they recently found that, that an officer who had uh, used deadly force against somebody who was suicidal was not granted qualified immunity for those protections. And that's in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. And, 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 and the, 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 the stress was, so, so just a, a quick summarization of that, you had an end, it was a call for uh, assistance. There was a woman who was suicidal. Her husband came downstairs, told the responding sheriffs what was going on. The woman, uh, the sheriff went up to engage. She had pulled out a knife. She continually kept coming at the officer. The officer kept trying to back up. And then ultimately the officer did shoot that woman. And the emphasis was on what other, did you retreat? Did you transition to other, le or to other use of force options? You had a taser, why did you not use the taser? Why did you not use your OC spray or your baton? So those are things, these are the type of conversations that we might have to look at in the future. And again, I'm not asking for the council to even talk about that tonight. 
Um, so I would advocate um, consideration for an increase in our training budget, specifically looking at how much it would cost us to, um, to send folks to training, uh, those types of increase. Uh, note and in, in up there with those slides, it talks about what our current training budgets are, and it gives example of how much some of these trainings are to send our folks uh, to these trainings so that they're more professional and more proficient, and they can bring that level of experience back to the department to give to other officers in a more cost-effective uh, way. So again, that is my tirade on training and uh, scenario base. So uh, mental health proficient or professional funding. I am going to say that I, on this one, I, I, I did not do too much due diligence on this one. I reached out to the Washington County Mental Health Services. We've looked at what that cost estimate would be. That's 125K, 82 for a full-time, 41 for a part-time. While Washington County Mental Health Services and I, we, we had discussion and we thought that we might get more bang for the buck regarding for a, a professional um, uh, mental health worker, somebody who is trained and educated in, 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 uh, in, in counseling. But what we should have done was bring in more people uh, to the table before. So, so I, um, for this slide, I would primarily, my, my, my goal, takeaway point, and I'm going to turn it over to Dan, would just be to allow us more time to talk to other people in this space, in this area, to come up with an idea or solution or a recommendation of what this type of funding would go for if the council decided to give it. And uh, so I'll just give it to Dan. Thank you, Chief Pete. Um, would it be okay to turn the lights on? Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I want to thank the leaders in this room for, for uh, taking the proactive step of forming the Montpelier Police Review, Review Committee, which, uh, will, uh, which I am very confident is going to help move the city closer and closer to a progressive person-centered approach to uh, public safety. Secondly, this is my first uh, city council meeting in a long time, and kudos to you and the Zoom world for all the time <laughs> and effort you folks put in. Uh, next ballot should should look about a, uh, an increase in your compensation. Um, <laughs> and finally, Chief Pete's been a, an absolute delight to work with during the, during the time on the police review committee. He's really been a breath fresh of fresh air. So we are very fortunate to have Chief Pete as the leader of our, our public safety here in the city. Um, I am Dan Toll. I'm a Montpelier resident and the president uh, of a um, mental health and law enforcement uh, management advisory firm, uh, and of course a member of the Montpelier Police Review Committee. Uh, I've come here to help clarify the intent of this particular recommendation, which is all about uh, mental health funding for crisis response. Um, before I get into uh, my issues, I would like to address my background and credentials in mental health. Uh, this mask doesn't want to seem to stay up. What? So can, all right. Please don't yell at me. Um, first of all, um, I'm a, a mental health advocate, uh, and with my team, uh, promote uh, our our goal is to promote transformative social change in mental health and in the disability arena. I am a psychiatric survivor. Um, I have a uh, major mood condition that I've dealt with for many decades. Uh, as Chief Pete mentioned, I work for the National Alliance of Mental Illness, uh, also for um, the Mental Health Agency Pathways Vermont uh, as a support line <laughs> operator. And, in, and I volunteer as well um, on a number of different committees at the statewide level, uh, the AHF, the AHS Mon uh, Mental Health Integration Council, which is co-chaired by uh, Dr. Levine. In addition, I sit on uh, several several committees at the Department of Mental Health, including the Adult State Program Standing Committee, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Agency, which is the federal arm of AHS for Substance Abuse Mental Health, and uh, I'm on the Block Grant Planning Council. And uh, Basically, uh, for all of those volunteer and work commitments, I try to be the voice of people who have mental health conditions. And uh, I don't like the word disabled. I'd rather say otherly abled. Um, and with that, I'd like to address this particular slide. Um, the, intent, the intent of this particular recommendation was to add a third leg to the crisis response stool, which is comprised of law enforcement, social work, and peer support. 
um, the the goal was to, was to add one full time peer support worker and add a, a half of a social worker to the existing social work we have right now who splits her time between half her time with Barry and half her time with us. So we end up with one social worker, one peer support worker, all working together with Chief uh, Pete's wonderful team of law enforcement professionals here in the city. Um, this particular set of recommendations, as Chief Pete indicated, it's, it's a work in progress and, and uh, we're, we're having a dialogue uh, around the fact that um, really we need, uh, we're, we're, our recommendation is that we take, uh, or I should say my recommendation, I need to own this, that we take a step back, as Chief said, and um, for Washington County Mental Health, the Police Department, and the peer support leadership, uh, leadership in, in, the, in the state, in particular locally, it's another way for those of you who are familiar. Uh, and look at the optimal way to, to allocate this 1.5 uh, FTE personnel between social work and peer, peer support crisis worker, uh, peer support crisis workers. Um, and I would add, just as, a, as an aside, as we discussed in the committee, um, when it comes to the funding issue, there is funding available um, from both uh, federally, from SAMHSA, as well as from DMH, for peer support crisis workers um, and, uh, uh, and other uh, progressive uh, s law enforcement social working initiatives. And uh, I would, uh, er, I would say th that that is an opportunity that we can <coughs> we can try to take advantage of uh, in terms of uh, funding to uh, off the, to avoid drawing more down from the, uh, the the city's budget. Thank you. <coughs> Continue on it again. Uh, just again for that record, it, it, I am a huge also a huge proponent of peer, peer advocacy is, is a lot of people will refer to it as a secret sauce and a, and a response model. And I think what this does is highlights that there is a, there's a desperate need to figure out what these response models might look like and how to, re uh, and how to find the resources to fund them all. And we're not realistically expecting that the council should look and, and try to take it upon itself to do that. We're committed to finding other ways and resources to make this happen to the best of our ability and not burden the city with doing it. There's funding and opportunity out there. We're going to find it. So with the street outreach ca uh, capacity, um, anyone, uh, we believe that uh, uh, we can, any training that we would need regarding street outreach, would we can find that in-house. We can reach out with, again, our community partners and get that training in-house so, so folks would know what they're um, what they're seeing when they're looking at uh, certain issues and incidences and calls for service. Um, for the record that the, uh, the PRC did recommend, I believe an additional funding of 1.5 persons regarding street outreach. Uh, Good Sam previously had one full-time E, uh, I believe funding. And since then uh, that the council did agree, I think to fund another half. So I think that equates to one full-time, uh, one, one FTE. So uh, this is what they're looking at, two people working 24 hours each. 40 hours for outreach and additional resources. So at this point, uh, to, to looking at what the PRC's recommendations are, you've already done one. You would only need to do a point .5 at this point, and uh, we, the numbers come up to about 47.5. And again, this is something that we're, we're budget neutral in. This is not a MPD decision. This is uh, uh, on the council, just information for you all's uh, knowledge in making uh, decisions. So human trafficking, regarding the, the training for human trafficking, um, Again, we're gonna talk about those other ordinances for a later date. This is just uh, talking about the relevance about upcoming budget discussions. So we've long utilized a trauma-informed approach regarding our interactions with our community members as well as our investigations. And we're gonna continue to prioritize that and looking to protect victims and prevent re-victimization and the go uh, to, uh, to look at the cause and those who are actually doing human trafficking and devote our resources there. Um, Human trafficking is taking place in Vermont. It is significant. It is here in Montpelier. Um, I will tell you that while historical data shows that we've had a min minimal number of investigations, and I had to do some thinking about that, and knowing now the, the level of the prevalency of that's going on out there, 
I honestly think that the reason we're not having more human trafficking investigations is because our department doesn't know what to look for in certain cases. So um, we've reached out to, uh, to some folks and we're looking at trying to find, like so to give you an example, um, some of the information that we got was that approximately 61% of sex trafficking cases in Connecticut have at one point in time trafficked here in Vermont. Uh, so, so there is a prevalency there. So we've reached out and we've looked and found uh, somebody who can come in and give us this training with our current training budget. The only thing we have to do is pay for is their lodging and them coming here. And that's only gonna roughly be $20 or $2,000. And they're also going to come in here and talk to us about the dark web and how some of this stuff is done online. Not it gone are the days of Craigslist. There are more covert ways of how these things are happening. And there are, there are a multitude of ways of human trafficking. Some people, if you say human trafficking, they're thinking of what happened in Rutland. There are several people who are handcuffed in a locked room and they're gonna move all the way to something. Human trafficking can be something as, is, is, uh, is I would say, a, a daily occurrence of somebody who may, unfortunately, be using their own kid or family members and trafficking them out. Uh, for these types of gains. So this is something, again, we would anticipate having a one-time one cost within our current training budget and then bringing these trainings here to Montpelier and then continue to train ourselves and work ourselves to be better um, at finding and seeing these types of things. Data transparency. So uh, we strongly agree with this one, data, data, data. Um, but there are some limitations to this, and this comes in form of time. And it also, in, in absence of time, it's going to come in from um, in, in with technology and with money, um, so administrative staffing. So because of the potential costs that are involved, um, there may be like an RFP process in, in, in looking at for systems and programs that might help us better to put information out there. So like, say, for example, if we could find a system that would say, Here's the data as we put it in when we're working on the street in our calls for service. And that the public can go online, they can file reports online, they can look at crime mapping to see what we were called for in what area, get their information there, and even do their own data mining from the system. So if they want to pull stats and see what the arrest records were, how many traffic stops that we've had, they can do that. There are systems out there that can, uh, case management systems, records management systems and computer aided dispatcher CAD systems. There are products out there that can do that. So if there's a way that we could potentially fold this into the Televate stu uh, study that, that talks about communications and there is a potential here, but that's a very complicated dialogue with so many moving partners, uh, parts and partners that are involved. So I'm asking for a little bit more time to conduct due diligence before I can bring these types of particular options. I just don't want to come to you and say, oh, you want data? Give me three people. That's not fair. That's not realistic. And that's stupid. So, uh, so we want to find out what our due diligence efforts are, what this might look like, and how it would impact any request that we have for project funding. So uh, like at a first glance, just to give you an idea, initial cost could be somewhere like a one-time purchase for these systems of like 40 or 400000 but the good news is you can, we can pull these payments out at very low interest rates to just say in four years, we're just gonna pay it off. And then the years after, we only have like five grand to pay to maintain this system. Um, so body-worn cameras. I'm gonna turn it over here to Alex here pretty soon, but just uh, of course, we're, we, we also uh, recommend uh, body-worn cameras. We agree with that assessment. We would recommend, I would recommend, a company called Visual Labs. Visual Labs is a, is a smartphone-based system. There's no proprietary cost involved, so you don't have to go, like if you go to Axon or WatchGuard or other agencies, you might have, you have to buy the camera. The camera's only good for X amount of time, then you gotta buy it again. You gotta get docking stations for upload. You gotta do all kinds of different things. With Visual Labs, I can get these phones for 99 cents and then I can get the app installed on here and I can do everything that a body-worn camera does, but I also have the flexibility of where technology is moving. Like say, for example, they're getting out there, technology is moving away from having in-car computers to uh, just a docking station for your phone. You slide your phone in and then you type and you work off that. So there are so, and there, there's so many other apps that we have or so many other programs that we're working with and trying to upgrade to that would also work with, um, with smart smartphones. So pros are 
with, uh, with uh, Visual Labs is that the costs are extraordinarily lower than competitors, requires minimal hardware, and uh, re purchasing of recur recurring proprietary purchases. There's already a statewide body-worn camera pro policy that exists, so it's not something that we would have to develop and then, and then go through the entire due diligence process. It's already there, and we, we would have to follow that based on certification and based on like the state law. So um, again, uh, these types of phones will allow us for backup. So if we're in an area where our radios don't work, we can pop on a push to talk app and work from there. Um, and again, <laughs> it's, it's more adaptable to emergency technology. Uh, the cons are that it would require uh, a perpetuity f additional funding in the budget, which would be around 35000 each year. Half of it would go towards the service costs of having the, the data plan for the phones, and the other half would be for the subscription service. So Alex, are you still there, sir? Oh, sorry about that. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, can you hear me now? As they say. Great, thank you. So again, my name is Alexander, and I work for Visual Labs. And if, if somebody would help me, I know that City Council City Council Chambers camera had the slides up. I have them on my other monitor here, but then I can sort of follow along and she, he can uh, 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 move those forward. So, um, yeah, there we go, perfect. Yeah, um, and there we go. So the general body board camera goals, I'm sorry, it's on the other screen, not trying to uh, disrespect anyone by not looking at you, but uh, and I think uh, Chief, you already mentioned some of these things. Uh, the, 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 one of the keys, and it, it really, it, it, it clearly helps everyone, not only the law enforcement personnel, but the citizens, transparency and accountability that the body cameras tell the truth. Got the video and audio of what happened in a situation. It improves that trust and cooperation between law enforcement um, and the citizens. It's the evidence, minimizing false complaints, allegations, and I think one of the keys here that, that people don't necessarily focus on is production of liability. Um, it, it is almost a, equivalent to an insurance policy where, yes, as, as Chief Pete said, it might cost you know, roughly $35,000 a year. That could easily, in one instant, save a million dollars of liability. And I'll give you one example. Uh, Federal Heights, Colorado. Uh, it's in the Metro Denver area. They, they had a different vendor for body cameras. They switched to ours. And because of some of the location analytics, uh, they were able to prove that their officer did not uh, violate their pursuit policy. And because they're in uh, Metro Denver in urban area, they have a no pursuit policy over 50 miles an hour, uh, unless it's life threatening. And an officer got into a stolen vehicle pursuit speeds very quickly hit 50 and the officer pulled off and, and, and ceased the pursuit and then tragically that stolen vehicle about a mile ahead struck and killed a pedestrian and the pedestrian's family's lawyer came in to sue the city claiming that the officer had caused the death of, of that individual and the chief uh, said absolutely not we can prove it with our analytics show the speeds that were uh, taken by that officer and when speeds hit 50, they could see him turning back into the station through all the geographic mapping that we have that's just inherent in the system. Again, we're using smartphones, so we're getting GPS out of that. And happy to go into more details of any data or, or that. But um, again, more than just recording a conversation, but, but a lot uh, uh, deeper than that. And then obviously the officer safety and training, you know, that goes part of that. So if you slip uh, one more slide up now, um, perfect. Uh, equipment consolidation, as Chief Pete mentioned, uh, we're using a smartphone. And we, we like to say BWC does not mean body-worn camera, but instead means body-worn computer, because we're taking a, a, a very powerful electronic device and replacing everything you see on the left side of the screen, body camera and docking station and a digital camera and an audio recorder, personnel locator, all that can be combined into a single device, a smartphone. 
And what you see here, these geofences that I was sort of mentioning, all the location analytics that go with that, uh, and the live streaming capability, which would potentially save not only just an officer's but citizen lives, where if someone with the right permission can turn on a body-worn camera remotely and get a live video and audio feed. In theory, Chief Pete sitting here in the council chambers, or sitting there in the council chambers, if he uh, heard one of his officers was involved in a, in a shooting, he could turn on that camera and watch it remotely from where he was, assuming, you know, obviously he would have those permissions. So using a smart device and a software I should probably step back just momentarily and say Visual Labs, we're a software company, not a hardware company. All our body camera company competitors are hardware companies. They all make proprietary hardware. We have developed an application, an app that goes on the smartphone in conjunction with the backend evidence management website. Uh, and so we're purely software based and can therefore you know, make things much more uh, customizable for agencies. We've been doing this for coming up on eight years now in January, and we've got hundreds of agencies all around the country. So this is, this is a, a very well proven system. Um, anyway, uh, next slide. Uh, camera positioning options. Uh, th this is often a question we get. Well, we've got our citizens there, you know, videoing us holding a smartphone in their hand that's not going to work for us as police officers and, and you know, of course not the camera is mounted just like any other system any other body camera system either in the chest uh, potentially even as low as the belt because uh, with a wide angle lens on many smartphones uh, and then the officer controls when that camera can start and stop just like any other system uh, and then policies would dictate when they should turn it on, when they should turn it off, you know, when that is allowed or disallowed, things like that. Uh, next, next slide. The uh, uh, redaction, which is built into our system, we have that uh, integrated into the system where if you have to release videos to the public, uh, both the audio can be redacted or distorted and faces can be blurred out, as you see here. Uh, there was unfortunately a very tragic uh, incident took place uh, just outside of Atlanta with one of our customers and they uh, uh, issued a, a piece of the body worn camera footage and, and blocked out some, uh, some of the innocent people in that footage and they used that footage to track down a, a, a very violent suspect. But anyway, that's all included and, and built in uh, to our system. Uh, next one is the real-time uh, officer safety feature, and that's where we get this positional awareness, again, with the GPS that's coming from the smartphones, which is both from the satellites and cellular triangulation, that uh, the, the chief or someone on, you know, at the command staff uh, in dispatch could see exactly where all the officers are at any point in time, and so they would know how to send help or where to send help exactly uh, if there were any kind of critical situations. The remote activation capability I already mentioned. Uh, one of our uh, customers is the state of Georgia, their Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and during the protests in Atlanta a summer ago, uh, they, they pulled most of their game wardens off the parks and the lakes, sent them to downtown Atlanta on their ATVs. And they were patrolling, kept things very well under control in downtown Atlanta during the protests. Uh, but they were live streaming from several dozen of our uh, smartphone body camera systems to a major a master control center with the governor and the FBI and, and other law enforcement agencies. So it can help control situations by knowing what's going on. It's that real-time situational awareness. The remote activation, uh, again, with this live stream uh, availability, so knowing where people are and what's happening on the ground uh, leveraging the connectivity of the smartphone. Simultaneous playback, this is just uh, something you know we'd like to see. Uh, it's just interesting to show the uh, evolution of technology. It's not necessarily just one picture from one camera because you often have multiple officers on the scene. And on this, you show four different uh, viewpoints uh, fr from uh, four different officers. Those videos can actually be all played simultaneously. And if you look at the next uh, slide there, it actually shows uh, those, those videos. So we've got four officers, A, B, C, and D at the scene, and you can actually see, this is a still 
from each of the four officers' uh, body cameras because no matter what system you have, you know, one individual camera might not capture the totality of you know, the situation that was you know, being presented uh, in itself. Um, and that, that's really it. I've got the you know, next slide is for, for questions and answers, either you know, uh, you know, any, anyone there. Um, I, I will say that the chief team and his officers tested the system. It was about a year ago now. Um, went through very extensive testing uh, with our system. Um, you know, we, we had to sample phones out there and, and they, they put it through its paces. And uh, you know, we're very happy that he ultimately compared our solution to others and uh, concluded uh, that, that he, he was recommending you know, the, the ultimate purchase of the Visual Labs, the smartphone body camera solution. So that's all I have, but again, happy to answer any uh, questions uh, that anyone has. All right, Alex, thank you very much, sir. Unless, I'm sorry, are there any questions related to the Body One camera system? No, I, I would just like to say I really appreciate getting these slides ahead because I've been very dubious about body cameras and, and slides really showed me how much these improved my issues with them, so thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, the, the, the technology has improved you know, far, far beyond a typical kind of GoPro type camera and we're leveraging that technology. We're based in Silicon Valley, you know, kind of the heart of the software technology. We've got a lot of very smart software engineers that, uh, you know, they, they live for innovation and technology. And uh, we can just keep advancing the system more and more, you know, as, as uh, the technology improves and allows both hardware and software uh, to, to, to provide a better system for law enforcement agencies. <laughs> You're my boss. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I'm sorry. Visual Labs Inc.com is the website. Obviously, Chief Pete knows how to get a hold of us. If there's any other questions, I'm sure you know he, he can answer questions as well. But for now, I'll sign off, and I appreciate your time as well. Thanks, Alex. And then I, I apologize. <laughs> I just I, I know time. It's late. Um, <laughs> So I, we only have two slides here. The, the, in closing, the slides are this just, uh, and again, I apologize for the size of it, but uh, this just talks about, this just breaks it down visually what the financial impact um, that we're anticipating would be related in, in relation to the uh, PRC recommendations. And again, I do want to emphasize that this one right here, the 15K uh, one-time training costs, um, probably eliminate that. Uh, everything else, I think we can find ways to squeeze that within, uh, with the, within the budget, but um, I'm also going to look for grant opportunities to try to fund a lot of these things. Excuse and me, Chief. Uh, sir? Do we know if there are any other uh, police departments in Vermont that are using the uh, Visual Labs system? No, sir. For the most part, it, uh, I believe, and, and Nord, you may be able to help me out on this one, but it looks like WatchGuard and uh, Axon. Yeah, I have a case that I'm working on or that I started out working on with the Capitol Police and they had uh, they have the Axon system. Yes, they just purchased it. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Chief, do you mind like, just maybe talking about the public records aspect of this a bit? Like, uh, I always remember Chief Faco <laughs> saying, like the, the storage component of it would be the most costly and not just like storing it, sort of the staff time associated with, like responding to massive requests. So like how, how long would you have to hold on to the data? You know, what sort of stuff could you expect in that regard? So looking at the, um, so, so, so technology has changed since then. Um, and so looking at that, and um, I apologize, I, this was something that was on my list to talk to you about. Um, that uh, <laughs> currently would, the, the 35, would include, it, it would more than cover, so the statewide uh, uh, policy regarding how long we have to hold certain types of footage for, that would be rolled into that entire 35. I think oh, we'd okay. be very, very good with that <laughs> rather than having to buy servers or do anything else like that, cloud-based technology, all of the sort. With the, with the automatic, or with the, the built-in redaction features, would save on administrative time, though it would be logical to expect we're going to see additional um, public records request. I do have some numbers if the council was interested. I could send that out at a later time. But 
Um, what I would say is uh, I, I don't want to necessarily put the cart before the horse and say the sky is going to fall. We're going to need three people to, to deal with it. If we do uh, are, are fortunate enough to get body worn cameras, um, I would think that a wait and see approach at this point in time would be more prudent than rather than saying if we're going to get body worn cameras, we need to get additional staff to help us with public records requests. I think we would need to look at the data behind that and see where that's that's beneficial. But uh, but in, and again, in the past, the redaction part of it would take an extraordinary amount of time. This technology, it's it, it's lengthy, but it's not nowhere near as time consuming. No VHS tapes anymore for this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I still got some at home, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. And uh, Madam Mayor, and then the, the last slide I have is just these were are the uh, the other options are the other topics for discussion re related to the PRC uh, report that can be talked about at a time of the council's decision that you're saying. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Any other um, questions about not just the body worn cameras, but about any of this from council? And then we'll go to public comment. Yeah, go ahead, Maureen. Thanks. Um, just one clarifying question. Are there steps that you see, Chief, like I understand um, just on the transparency point of, you know, if we want to significantly ramp up um, public access to data that there is the possibility of a different database and, you know, an expensive path. Are there, assuming that could take a while, um, are there like interim things you're thinking about to improve or is, I mean, Hopefully it's not like an either or and we just wait and, you know, it looks like a potentially long um, trajectory for a big data upgrade. So just curious if you're thinking about that. So some of the interim options would be purchasing some software systems or some platforms that can do some of these things individually. So it would be like a purchase of five grand here, or six here or three here to do that. And then there would also be an administrative lift that would accompany those types of purchases. So, it, so yeah, yes, ma'am. There, there I am looking at those options, but I'm trying to work some more due diligence uh, related to it. But the interim process would be purchasing other types of systems uh, and then additional staffing. <laughs> Donna, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was going to see if there's any council questions, but I'm happy to go to right to public comment now if, if that's. She's a committee member. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's let's do that. Well, let's go to that now. So um, we'll go to Alyssa, and then I, I know you've got a, a comment there. So yeah, go ahead, Alyssa. There, there we go. Thank you for unmuting me. Um, <laughs> hi, Alyssa Sharon, chair of the Police Review Committee, or maybe former chair. I don't know if we're currently active or not, but we still feel somewhat active. Um, thank you so much, Chief P and MPD, for your openness to so many of the Police Review Committee um, ideas, and so appreciate how you are utilizing community partners for some of the training ideas and the train the trainer models you're putting forward to as well as the virtual training options. I think that's a, a really efficient way of doing it and a cost effective way of doing it. And um, thank you, Dan, for being in the room today and for clarifying the uh, mental health recommendation. I think that was really uh, a helpful perspective to bring. I, I mostly have a process question for um, you, uh, Mayor Watson, and the committee, which is the, the council, which is how we should engage in this. Um, specifically, uh, you know, I think the Police Review Committee might be interested in weighing in on some of the questions posed by Chief Pete. Like, for example, questions about the community engagement protocol for after use of force incidents. He put forward a question to the council, like, how should we engage with you on this? I think we might have some suggestions based on our, um, you know, extensive conversation. That's true also on, you know, the demilitarization 1033 program of the pro literally the process of how this might be accessed and the engagement between MPD and the council. So, I'm wondering, is this the right time to do it now, or will you be taking this up again in the future? And um, I just, and also, I just want to flag that in the future, um, it would be great if um, 
committee members were, were invited or flagged that, that something was on the agenda. We found out about 45 minutes. I found out about 45 minutes before the meeting tonight, so scrambled to invite people that, as you can imagine, we're not really prepared to thoroughly engage at this point. We would love to in the future. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you for that. Um, so a couple thoughts. One uh, is I think getting into the details of the answers to those questions is probably not what we're going to be doing tonight. I think we're mostly just taking the temperature of the council to see if like generally speaking is this are, are the, should we be moving forward with those conversations um, in detail and I'm sort of guessing that you know, for some of the items that have budget implications, like we're going to take those up sort of individually for things about the use of force um, uh, protocols, like that will be um, someone, <laughs> well, perhaps perhaps the, the chief, perhaps um, someone else uh, will be coming back to us with some with a protocol that we would then uh, potentially approve. Um, and so those conversations um, I think we're probably not the right fit for a council, um, is my guess, at least not right now anyway. Um, but then that does leave, leave the question of like, when and how does that continue? And I'm curious for your for thoughts, suggestions, or input, or what you all are willing to do. Like in part, you know, your mission to create, produce this report is sort of done, right? But, um, but there may, may be some useful follow-up um, as we get into those details. So um, I feel like I've only partially answered your question um, about this. Fine. I think what I'm taking away from one thing you said is that there will be other opportunities to engage. Yeah. I know whether or not we are an active committee, committee members really care about these topics. Yeah. And we've done a lot of work together you know, with CP and MPD and might have some helpful suggestions along the way. And so um, you know, we support, as the chief said, like the recommend what he put forward, we generally support. There might just be, as we get more into the weeds, um, suggestions around process if we were going to get controlled equipment, you know, that okay. from the 1033 program, that kind of thing. And we could do that in writing, or we could do that actively, or we could do that, you know, outside of council. I think there's a lot of options, but one takeaway is we're not doing it right now. That's fair. fair, and I, I ooh, that's exciting. Okay, and I, I also, okay, I, I guess I would also be, be interested in the opinions of the committee, like, if you, if you want, to, like, if you think people want to continue to meet to collectively have that conversation, you know, I, I certainly don't want to um, disenfranchise that group from continuing if you want if you want to keep um, uh, you know collectively weighing in but uh, in part I want to leave that to you and to, to the group um, otherwise you know uh, individual participation makes sense to me um, there was another part of your question though which was about um, uh, how people are notified, and I think that is that is uh, worth yeah, noting. <laughs> absolutely, and I, I was just going to follow up on that, Alyssa. And, um, we'll commit that committee members are notified anytime any of this is on the agenda, and well in advance. Um, we had actually, I don't know why that didn't happen this time. It, it should have. So um, we'll make sure that, that that's taken care of. And I think, in terms of your question in general, I don't want to answer for the chief, but you know, maybe we should have a conversation the three of us or two of us about does it make sense to have one more meeting with a debrief or something like that um, now that we're having these conversations uh, but I don't want to commit anybody's time without us sort of thinking it through so that sounds great why don't I pull the committee members you know as we get into the details to see if folks want to meet and if not then maybe we figure out individuals to connect with on certain issues like Dan you're going to want to in be engaged on the mental health issue moving forward as an individual or as a committee member. Either way, you know that's clear. So if we can't meet as a body, I'm sure we could we can figure out who might be point on which which issue. So I'll pull folks and then um, loop back with Chief Pete and CP on the agenda. Okay. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Um, yes, and Richard.
Did you have something you also you wanted to add? Are, are we done with this? Are we done with this agenda item? Not uh, quite. Um, well, the council still got a. <laughs> one last comment at the end. Okay. If that's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I get the ten o'clock hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm only going to take about three minutes of the ten o'clock hour. Uh, my name's Richard Shear, District Two Loomis Street. And it's it's real difficult. I'd like to talk about the what you're calling militarization. Um, but I'd like to frame it differently. And unfortunately, we're not going to talk about the Civilian Police Review Board, which I consider to be wild overreach. And I just read the 1033 one as a solution looking for a problem, simply because we haven't had, we haven't used that program since Chief Hoyt. And we used it for one rifle. You know, and it's been city policy amongst Brian, amongst Tony, not to use that program for years, except for perhaps for clerical items. And I don't even think for that we've really reached into it. But we do use that program. When you talk about procurement, it's different than use. When we call in the state police, they are sometimes using equipment that's procured from that program. And my fear, is that when we talk about 1033, it's a, a wedge to interject on the state police and on how they see their professionalism. And I come back to the shooting that happened, um, the police shooting over at the high school. We had a piece of equipment that was coming into that scene that would have allowed the negotiator to get closer and closer and would have possibly resolved that without the tragedy. That was a piece of military equipment. And my fear is that in addressing 1033 that way, we're in a sense saying that Montpelier police can do it all themselves. And, or that we're going to call in an emergency and say, okay, what kind of equipment are you bringing? Where'd you get that equipment? It's a much more nuanced situation than it's presented in that particular recommendation. Uh, so that caught my eye, as well as the others, and I'll be back when we do discuss other elements of, of this report that I felt fairly strongly. I would like to address the Police Review Commission and say it was a great report. I mean, it was very thorough, and I felt like it was really well thought. I might disagree, but boy, you guys really provided uh, your thought documented quite well. And I congratulate you for doing that, and I thank you for doing that. It took three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, OK. Anybody else either in person or online? Uh, I understand <coughs> these are preliminary, but the ones that are budgetary are coming up sooner than later. Uh, as a technology literate person, I have concerns about the smartphone, just the, the smartphone application versus a purpose-built camera. The, I've watched the other officers, other departments use the purpose-built cameras. The controls for activating them and deactivating them are very uh, blind. I mean, can be done without looking. I'm concerned that uh, the attention of an officer going to his phone to figure out how to turn it on and start recording is not something an officer is typically going to be willing to give up in a, in a hostile or a potentially dangerous situation. So uh, I just raise a red flag. Cheapest is not necessarily best in, in this situation. Uh, so I will speak more about it later, but I think I'd like to see a comparison uh, broken out separately of the hardware, the licensing, and then the storage, because we do also have uh, options. We've got hardened data centers both at Velco and at VTEL that could potentially be certified for forensic grade data storage within the state uh, rather than the exorbitant rates that some of these vendors are charging for cloud storage. Um, I have a lot more to say about it, but not tonight. All right, thank you. Okay, anybody else, either in person or digitally? Okay, and uh, Dan, you wanted to add something? Uh, yes, I just wanted to finish by acknowledging um, individually the members of the committee, uh, Council, Councilperson McCullough, Councilperson Hurl, 
uh, Jen Dugan, Abby Germain, but uh, in particular, two of the workhorses, Mike Sherman, who I think is on the line now for all the work he did early on in the process, and then to Justin Dreschler, who was the heaviest lifter. Uh, I think he's, I would call him an Olympic, uh, <laughs> Olympic lifter for, for all the work he did at the end to pull the report together. And lastly, and uh, uh, not leastly, the absolute wonderful leadership of, of uh, Alyssa Sherman. It was a delight to work with, with her and the whole team, and um, I'm glad we were able to put, pull together um, <coughs> the report and recommendations that we did. Great. Thank you. Uh, so thoughts, questions from council. Um, I guess the, the question that we really need to answer is um, are we uh, ready to take some next steps in each of these <laughs> uh, uh, particular items? Are there any red flags? Are there, um, what, are, what are your thoughts on moving forward? Well, if you want a general statement, I mean, I really support us moving forward with the staff recommendations as presented in our agenda. It makes sense that we definitely can explore more details of each, but I would recommend that we follow those recommendations. Kind of, there's nothing more to say, just a thumbs up. <laughs> That's fine. I'll say just <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure, like, like Donna said, we'll be fleshing it out, but I think generally yeah. we're going in the right direction here. Yeah. Yeah, anything else folks want to say? Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Well, I, I just think it might be worthwhile um, to do a bit of a, an inventory of the recommendations and understand where the decisions need to be made. I feel like some of them can just be, can happen through the budgeting process and, you know, and as, as we work through that, but then there's others that might require more feedback from the committee, like Alyssa. Um, mentioned, um, et cetera. So ag agreed that we're certainly moving in the right direction, but having kind of a um, knowing where we could just sort of <laughs> give a Connor's thumbs up and be good and other things <laughs> where we need to um, to dig a little bit deeper and if there's, a, if there's a, a specific decision that the council might need to make about something that's beyond just approving a certain budget line item, I think would, would be really helpful in terms of, of moving forward. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, and I, I agree, I think, uh, gosh, with the incredible diligence of uh, the Police Review Committee as well as uh, you know the, the work that you and the department have done, uh, Chief, to, to uh, you know, see how these things can align, I, I think we're, we are moving in the right direction and uh, it's, this is very encouraging. Um, I think there's some great steps forward that we can take here and continue to be a leader uh, in the state on um, all of these uh, these issues. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to getting into details and um, making it happen. So, um, yes. I, I just want to thank the department uh, already on the community engagement piece. I, I think we've seen some huge steps forward. It's great to see coffee with a cop happening regularly. You know, I think uh, Corporal Philbrick's doing a, a great job in some of his new duties. You know, just having like his presence at the homelessness task force last meeting. It says a lot, I think. It says that MPD is there to listen to the front people on the ground, and um, you know, I don't think that goes unnoticed. And, and I apologize, but I do want to want to take, if I could, just take a quick second. To, we got a, a an email from uh, the the deputy assistant director for the U.S. Marshals earlier this week, specifically noting what Diane has been doing. Um, and his, his work with the one person who had to, she helped him get his hearing aid and oh, yeah. that was posted on Facebook. He sent an email saying that that's community, that's 21st century policing and that our department should continue to move forward doing that. So I'm extraordinarily proud of her and, and of the unit. So thank you all very much for that. Yeah, that was a great awesome. story. Um, if people haven't seen that, so. All right, um, Lauren. I'm just glad to hear, obviously, have already voted on all of these, and I'm glad to see that, um, that we're moving forward and appreciate Chief, you and the, the staff team kind of fleshing out a lot of the ideas and how it's going to work, and that's great to see. Um, I, like, totally agree, I think, like, moving forward with all of it, and there should be more 
community conversation of you know body cameras and all of that so whether some of that might be you know sessions I know you've been doing a lot of community um, engagement sessions on different topics and stuff so maybe some could be done that way and some at council meetings um, so just like thinking through how to you know educate and engage and get feedback from folks as we move forward but glad to see we are moving forward with all these and then I guess just process wise so there's the kind of set that is agreed upon and then some of the um, other <laughs> recommendations just it, like hoping that there's a plan to just take those up and have those discussions as well um, but I think this process of starting with the ones that everyone agrees on and making sure that the budget reflects those pieces um, makes a lot of sense so just making sure we're not leaving behind the other pieces altogether great um, all right so I'm wondering if we need a motion on moving forward I'm not sure that we do I don't think um, so. I you don't think so okay uh, I think I think we're pretty clear uh, that kind of in alignment which is great awesome all right well thank you so much you again all right well I think we're ready to move on to our uh, otherwise last agenda item and to be fair it's after 10 do you want to take it up do you want to table what's that we could how how do you how would you feel about that it, it, it actually might be good if Lauren and I are the remaining members after Dan has left um, it might be good to talk about appointing a third member if there's interest and maybe we could even maybe huddle a little bit before the next meeting then. Okay, that's fine. Um, Anybody's interested? Is anybody interested <laughs> in <laughs> the, the, yes, the, is that what it's called, the lobbying thing? Uh, yep. I, think, I believe it's called legislative advocacy. There we go. That sounds better. That does sound better. <laughs> Less sleazy than lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> um, going once, going I'm ahead. a maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. All Jake's right. a power player at the state. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so you all so may. You get invited to the meetings, and you may or may not show up. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so Jack's the third member. Um, so, <laughs> so we'll take that up uh, next time then. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Great. All right, on to our council reports. Donna. Well, I, I do want to go back a little oh, bit to sure. the police review. I appreciate oh, sure. the um, memo, I guess. It's actually pretty long we got from staff. That was a lot of time. And to me, that sort of laid out what I, I could perceive what we needed to do next. So I really appreciate that. It was very helpful. And I appreciate that you all listened and had Doug Hoyt here and Paco when I was gone to talk about public safety authority. Great. Uh, you haven't demolished us while I was missing. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and it's great to be back to Vermont. There's a, a lot of uh, strange behavior about masks elsewhere in the world. It's, uh, it's very strange to be in a place that won't wear masks. It's uh, really uh, very appreciative that we have a, a, a politeness of trying to protect ourselves and one another as well as ourselves. So. Anyway, thank you all for being yeah. here. <laughs> uh, just encourage folks. Uh, I, got, I got my booster shot a couple of days ago. I'm st <laughs> still feeling like death as a result of it. But <laughs> but if you if you go up to the mall there, it, it's so easy. So you, you, it's quicker than getting like a cheeseburger, and they're really efficient. They're like each one of them doing like 40 jabs a day. Uh, so really, like if, if you want to get it, it's it's so quick and easy. Just pop up to the mall there. Uh, so just PSA on that. Yeah. Otherwise, good. Yeah, that's good. Well, I got mine two days ago, and I feel fine. So don't let <laughs> don't let Connor scare you off. It's I'm, no, I'm not saying I, I'm feeling. I, I'm feel my arm. I'm totally fine. That's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jennifer. I'm solid. Okay. All right. I'll stick with the uh, vaccine uh, theme and say. Thumbs up and congratulations to the school district for uh, yes. for getting hundreds of kids uh, vaccinated this week. It's uh, I heard tonight that it wasn't a fun experience for everybody, but the, what I heard was that it was kind of a party atmosphere in the school as the kids <laughs> were getting their shots, and uh, and I think it's great. I think 
um, kids are really recognizing that things they're doing, like getting their uh, their weekly uh, COVID tests and getting their uh, vaccinations, are doing their part to uh, work for the uh, health and safety of the community. Yes, I, I would <laughs> echo gratitude. <laughs> to the one of my children was one of the less happy, but is vaccinated. <laughs> um, but the only thing I wanted to to just note tonight, so I, I feel like ever since COVID struck, I've been like, the federal government's going to come through with money and just noting the passage of the infrastructure bill and hopefully the Build Back Better reconciliation package in a couple weeks. Um, but knowing now in hand the infrastructure and just um, talk to Bill about this, but it might be good once they've had a little time to digest to get our someone from our federal delegation staff in to talk with us about the opportunities and how this is going to impact cities. Because um, you know, I know for example, just in my professional world, like there's money going to state revolving fund for. Um, city water projects and stuff. So just us all understanding, especially as we go into budget season and bonding discussions and stuff of if that is gonna change any way we might think about prioritization or timeline for anything, because um, there's gonna be some new opportunities, which is exciting. So that's it for me, thanks. Okay. Uh, so I have two things. One is uh, first, thank you all for doing the budget survey. All, all seven of us have completed it so that's great so I can get you um, information about that and uh, second thing is November 18th Thursday um, it's next it's not tomorrow it's a week from tomorrow uh, is the uh, Challenger Memorial uh, rededication ceremony and so that's happening at four o'clock at the high school and uh, yeah I mean I think it'd be a good um, opportunity to, to remember and um, uh, to celebrate the lives of the, the astronauts who died. Um, but uh, anyway, I just want to make sure that was on folks' radar. Um, that's it for me. Probably worth mentioning that last night we had the Board of Civil Authority meet meeting to discuss the uh, reapportionment proposal from the reapportionment committee advising the legislature. And uh, of course, the proposal is to uh, divide our current two member house district into two districts and by a thin majority the board voted to advise against that um, that's out there and if anybody's listening wanted to know but I just personally like to thank so many of you all were there and it was it was it was great I mean it was it was just great to have so much participation from council especially you know considering you all are elected officials and we're talking about how we choose our elected officials so it's a uh, was very appropriate. Thank you. Keeping on the vaccine theme, I got mine on Friday and felt fine the whole time. There you go. Um, and to Donna's point, um, I've been traveling a lot to a nearby state who I won't call out, but there's a drastic difference in mask wearing just mm. between here and there. Hmm. Uh, extraordinarily wow. noticeable. So mm. just if you don't have to go abroad <laughs> to see to see differences. Um, speaking of vaccines, we will need to have a policy. Uh, we, we already have a policy that I've adopted administratively for staff, but for OSHA, um, and it may be delayed now because of some court case, but we will have to adopt a policy with regard to um, employee safety and that, you know, it, it could be everything from mandatory vaccines to mask wearing, all these other things. So we're putting something together. It should be on your agenda, probably one of the next couple meetings. Um, just so that you're thinking about that. Um, and we are, in fact, trying to understand the, the, the bill and all that's in it. We've, I think VLCT will be also providing us with a lot of resources on that. I, I, I'm a little concerned about, I mean, it's great that it's happening, so yay. <laughs> Timing may be weird as we, you know, we're really getting gearing up to do our budget and make these kind of decisions and, you know, we have to make decisions on bond votes by January and you know will rules even be written and things by by then so but be that as it may I also I'm guessing there will be more years to take advantage of it so we're on it and I you know 
I think our plan right now is just to go forward with our budget and if there's stuff that we have in our budget that can be eligible for this, great, and we'll just have backfill projects to <laughs> fill the budget up because we've got, as you've seen, we have a long, long list and probably not money to do them all this year, so. Okay. That's all I have. Okay, great. Um, I think that is it, so um, without. And, and reminder that tomorrow is the Veterans Day holiday, so yes. City Hall will be closed. All right, so thank you. Uh, and so without objection, we will uh, consider this meeting adjourned, 1023. Thanks, everybody.